Our story kicks off with our main guy, Seinjin, hitting the books hard at the library. Suddenly, his phone rings, someone needs a lift. He tells them he'll be there in a jiffy and quickly packs up. As he's bolting for the exit, he spots a giant banner screaming we love you Seinjin. That's not all, there's a whole cheerleader squad putting on quite a show. A girl from the squad offers him flowers and asks him out. Quite a spectacle, right? Everyone's got their phones out, capturing the moment. But Seinjin, cool as a cucumber, tells her he doesn't do dating and suggests she'd be better off hitting the books instead of chasing him. He strides off, stepping on the banner as he goes, and muses about how dating is more trouble than it's worth. He's got his mind set on landing a job before anything else. Meanwhile, our leading lady, Hani, is stuck at a class reunion that's more like a kiddie party. Kids are running amok, causing chaos. One little tyke, Hyunbin, is having a full-blown meltdown over a phone. Hani can't help but question the wisdom of his mom bringing the kids along. The mom's got her excuses. No babysitter. No help from the in-laws. Hani just nods sympathetically, trying to keep her cool. But when Hyunbin checks a tantrum and kicks her, spilling her drink, she's struggling to keep her smile. She tries to placate him with some food, but he spits it out and kicks up another fuss. Through it all, Hani keeps her smile intact, even when the mom suggests she hurry up and have kids of her own. As if things couldn't get worse, Hyunbin proceeds to throw up on her. Hani escapes to the bathroom, wishing she just stayed home with some comfort food and good TV. When she emerges, a classmate offers her a lift home. Grateful for an out, she accepts. Outside, Seinjin's waiting by his car, chatting with his sis. She's asking after him, and he assures her he's fine before inquiring about her husband. She assures him they're fine too and drops a hint that Hani's been asking after him. Suddenly, Hani's friend steps out of the restaurant, and Seinjin goes into full panic mode. He quickly ends the call with his sister, hides behind his car, and wonders what on earth he's going to do if Hani spots him. After all, she'd be sure to spill the beans to his sister. Seinjin then pulls up the hoodie of his sweater, trying to hide his face. He clears his throat, sounding a bit hoarse, and tells Hani's friend that he's just the driver. He adds that he's got a little cold, and the friend hands over the keys without a second thought, telling him to keep his lips sealed during the ride. As they're cruising along, Seinjin can't help but sneak peeks at Hani in the rearview mirror. He's curious about how she's been doing. Hani's friend announces that he's feeling woozy from too much booze and needs to take a nap. Hani merely nods and returns to her window gazing. Suddenly, she feels an unwelcome touch on her skirt. She swats away the hand, demanding to know what her friend thinks he's doing. Seinjin catches the exchange from the corner of his eye. The friend mumbles an apology, blaming it on his drowsiness, and goes back to sleep. Hani shoots him a glare before returning to her window. But then, there's that hand again. She loses it, yelling at the friend and telling Seinjin to stop the car. The friend brushes it off as another accident and drifts back to sleep. This time, Seinjin spots the hand creeping up Hani's leg. Hani grabs the offending hand and bites down hard. Seinjin slams the brakes, drags Hani out of the car, and confronts the friend. He tells him to go home if he's drunk. The friend turns belligerent, grabbing Seinjin who retaliates with a punch. He pulls down his hood, revealing his identity. Hani is shocked to see it's Seinjin. Just then, the cops show up. Fast forward to the police station, Hani is fuming, explaining the situation to the police. She declares that if Seinjin hadn't punched her friend, she would have. The friend whines about his possibly broken teeth, and Hani threatens to expose his behavior on their alumni page unless he settles the matter immediately. The police try to restore order and ask Seinjin for his personal information. Seinjin provides his name and social security number but stays silent when asked for his address. The cop asks if he's homeless. Seinjin admits that he's been crashing in his classroom, leaving the cop and Hani stunned. He explains that it's either the classroom or a buddy's place, given his current circumstances. After the police station ordeal, Hani is dragging Seinjin around the streets while he begs her to let him go. She grills him about why he moved out and whether his sister, Songkyung, knows about his situation. He admits she does, 
and when Hani mentions they're going to see his sister, he panics. She assures him they won't be visiting tonight, but she'll call Song Kyung first thing in the morning. Seeing Jin tries to dissuade her, even suggesting they grab dinner instead, but she doesn't let up. In a desperate move, he pulls her towards a tree, trapping her between him and the trunk. He leans in close, asking why she always lets her guard down like she did in the car. He reminds her that he's not a kid anymore, then hesitates before asking if it's okay for him to stay at her place. Hani responds with a swift punch to his face, reminding him of the days when she used to scrub his back in the women's sauna. Embarrassed, Seenjin follows her home, wincing as she yanks him along by the ear. When they finally get to Hani's place, she can't help but wrinkle her nose. You need a shower, Seenjin. You smell like a gym locker, she exclaims. Seenjin shrugs sheepishly, admitting he's been freshening up in the school bathrooms. He hands over his phone for charging and peels off his shirt right there in the living room. Hani blushes and turns away, her heart pounding as she plugs in his phone. She can't help but wonder when Seenjin got so, grown up. It feels like just yesterday they were both in school uniforms. She gathers his clothes for a quick wash, trying not to dwell on the ripped muscles she glimpsed. Meanwhile, Seenjin's sister, Song Kyung, is on her way to Hani's apartment. She's chatting with someone on the phone about her next doctor's appointment, adamant that she won't give up on having a baby. She tells the person she'll be spending the night at Hani's place and rings the doorbell. Hani glances at the security camera and is surprised to see Song Kyung. As she moves to open the door, Seen Jin pokes his head out of the bathroom asking who's there. Hani tells him it's his sister and reaches for the door handle again, but this time Seen Jin stops her. She shoves him aside, but he insists that Song Kyung doesn't know he's moved out. Hani can't understand why he didn't just ask his sister for help, but Seen Jin explains that he can't stand seeing Song Kyung tiptoe around her husband every time she helps him out. He wants to pay his own way through school and stop relying on his sister. As Song Kyung continues to ring the bell, Seen Jin begs Hani not to let her in. Just then, Hani's phone rings. It's Song Kyung, who tells her she's at the door. Hani glances at Seen Jin's pleading face and lies that she's at a friend's wake and won't be coming home tonight. Song Kyung asks who the friend is, but Hani insists it's someone she wouldn't know. Unfazed, Song Kyung says she'll stay over anyway and asks Hani for her passcode. Hani and Seen Jin start to panic. Hani ushers Seenjin upstairs and pretends she can't remember her passcode. Song Kyung grows impatient and starts guessing random numbers. Hani suggests that Song Kyung should just go home since there's no food in the house, but Song Kyung insists on trying Hani's phone number or birthday. As Hani continues to stall, she and Seenjin frantically hide his belongings upstairs. Finally, Hani admits to Seenjin that her passcode is her birthday. Seenjin insists they need to stop his sister from coming in. Hani suggests they tell her the truth just as Song Kyung manages to unlock the door. Seen Jin grabs Hani's hand and they both hide under a blanket. Song Kyung walks in, muttering about Hani leaving all the lights on and goes off in search of a phone charger. Hani whispers that Seen Jin's phone is already charging and he quickly covers her mouth with his hand. They freeze as Song Kyung pauses, thinking she heard something. Underneath the blanket, Seen Jin pulls Hani close. Her life had always been a monotonous routine, like running on a hamster wheel, but now Seenjin was the acorn jamming up the works. As he slowly removes his hand from her mouth, they lock eyes. Little did Hani know how much this fleeting moment would change her life. Song Kyung tosses her things on the couch and heads to the shower. As soon as they hear the water running, Hani and Seenjin or Jun, as she calls him, make a break for it. Jun grabs his phone and forgets his shirt in their rush to leave. Song Kyung pokes her head out of the bathroom when she thought she heard something but finds the apartment empty. With a burst of laughter echoing in the lobby, Hani and Jun skid to a halt, panting heavily. A couple of bystanders shoot admiring glances at Jun's bare torso, commenting on his chiseled physique. One even cheekily suggests he must be mad to stroll around shirtless. Jun blushes, suddenly self-conscious. In a spontaneous gesture, Hani shrugs off her own shirt and hands it over to him. He hesitates before accepting it, asking if she isn't cold now that she's dressed in only a camisole and shorts. She dismisses his concern, suggesting they should probably find somewhere to go. When he wonders about money, she flashes her card and proposes grabbing a bite to eat. 
They end up in a cozy restaurant, where Jun devours his meal and knocks back drinks. He offers Hani some but she declines, surprising him with the revelation that she quit drinking. He recalls how she used to educate him about alcohol, even when he was underage. She chuckles, admitting that she's trying to cut back as she gets older. The conversation takes a serious turn when he asks if she plans to marry. She bristles at the question, reminding him that she struggles to even keep a plant alive. She reveals that she recently found a job, thanks to Song Kyung, who happens to be her boss's wife. Despite being a contractor, Hani confesses she enjoys her life the way it is. Jun, refilling his glass, admits his fear of growing old alone. He doesn't want his sister to sacrifice for him, nor does he want his future child to have the same upbringing he did. He states his intention to settle his student loans, secure a steady job, save for a mortgage, and then consider marriage. He talks about his father and his desire to be a better parent. Hani teases him about being drunk, but he denies it. He confesses that he's been battling insomnia and hanging out with her has made him feel relaxed for the first time in a while. Suddenly, he slumps off his chair, fast asleep. Meanwhile, Song Kyung, fresh from the shower, decides to do Hani a favor by doing the laundry. She is surprised to find men's clothes in the basket. Outside the restaurant, a sleeping Jun leans against a pillar while Hani wonders what to do next. When her phone rings, she's startled to hear Song Kyung on the other end, questioning her about the men's clothes and whether she's secretly dating someone. Hani tries to pass them off as her own clothes, but Song Kyung isn't convinced. Just as Hani denies any romantic involvement, a drunken Jun mumbles a request for another drink, which Song Kyung overhears. Hani quickly hangs up, shaking Jun in frustration. She hoists the unconscious Jun onto her back, eliciting amused looks from passers-by. As she trudges through the streets, the sky opens up, drenching them both. Upon reaching a sauna, the attendant refuses to let them in due to Jun's state. Hani pleads with him to no avail and ends up sitting outside in the rain. She considers going home and confessing everything to Song Kyung but changes her mind, fearing the misunderstanding that might arise from Song Kyung seeing Jun like this. Hani nudges Jun, but he's out cold. The rain has stopped, but the chill in her bones won't go away. She's caught a cold, and she knows she can't spend the night on the streets. Just then, she spots a motel across the road. Hauling Jun up, she drags him towards it. The receptionist greets her with a weary smile, informing her that only the pricey jungle room is available. Hani shrugs, I'll take it. The room is on the third floor, and Hani lugs Jun up the stairs, muttering complaints under her breath. As they reach the landing, a group of guys spills out from one of the rooms, and one of them blocks her path. She tries to sidestep him, but he mirrors her movements. Annoyed, she's about to snap at him when he calls her by name. Dong Jin, she gasps, recognizing him. In her shock, she lets Jun drop to the floor. Of all the people and places, why did she have to run into Dong Jin at a motel? Fast rewind to freshman year orientation, Hani and Song Kyung were 18, bright-eyed, and eager. At a party, Hani had pointed out the handsome guys, chirping about college life and blind dates. Song Kyung had been more practical, focusing on her scholarship, graduation, and taking care of Jun. But one guy had caught Hani's eye. Dong Jin, strumming his guitar, had made her heart flutter. Back in the present, Dong Jin gives her a small smile, it's been a while. He introduces his colleagues who are heading to a restaurant. When asked if Jun is her boyfriend, Hani quickly corrects him, he's a close friend, she stammers, struggling to explain the situation. Dong Jin, however, steps in and hoists Jun up, asking for her room key. On entering the jungle room, Dong Jin whistles at its size and quirky decor, placing Jun on the waterbed. As he prepares to leave, Hani stops him, apologizing for missing his wedding. She asks about his wife, only to be hit with the news of his divorce. Shocked, she drops the snacks he'd handed her. Alone again, she sinks to the floor, her mind spinning from the revelation. She grabs a bottle of alcohol, memories flooding back. She remembers being a senior, giving up job hunting to follow Dong Jin's band. She used to write lyrics while they practiced, hoping to contribute. The band members had called her manager Hani and even read her lyrics aloud once. They were kind but pointed out that her words were a bit childish. 
All these memories rush back as she drowns herself in a drink, wondering where things went wrong. Dong Jin had approached her about using her lyrics in their band's performance. Hani had refused, taking back her lyric book. She had planned to confess her feelings to him through the song she'd written. One of the girls from the band picked up a bottle of alcohol, intending to celebrate the upcoming performance with Hani's song. But before she could take a swig, Dong Jin intervened, reminding her of his warnings about excessive drinking. When she resisted, insisting on disposing of the alcohol herself, Dong Jin countered that it wasn't just her decision. Her question about him taking responsibility led to an impulsive marriage proposal from Dong Jin. In response, Hani downed an entire crate of soju, blacking out. Waking up in the emergency room with her stomach pumped and the lingering smell of alcohol brought back the memory of that day. From then on, she swore off alcohol. Fast forward to the present, Hani is three bottles deep into soju again. Jun stirs awake with a throbbing headache, disoriented by his unfamiliar surroundings. Seeing the motel room, he panics, imagining Song Kyung's reaction if she finds them there. A drunk Hani teases him for growing up so fast, prompting him to urge her to sober up so they can leave. She brushes him off, muttering about needing to speak to Dong Jin. When Jun questions who Dong Jin is, Hani drunkenly confesses her past feelings for him, claiming she never dated anyone else after letting him go. She rambles on about Dong Jin, lamenting how she misunderstood his preference for sexy girls over nice girls. This revelation shocks Jun, who tries to reassure her that Dong Jin simply had a different type. A tearful Hani questions her attractiveness, attempting to strike sexy poses while Jun tries to dissuade her. Overwhelmed by the sudden physical contact, Jun struggles to maintain his composure. He hoists her up, affirming her sexiness and urging her to sleep it off. As he lays her down on the bed, she accuses him of lying. She challenges him to a staring contest, reminding him of their childhood game where she could always tell when he was lying. Back when Hani was in middle school and Jun in elementary, Jun had lied to her about taking a poster. She had grabbed his face and begun counting to ten, a tactic to get him to confess. At the count of five, she had squeezed his ears, making him admit his lie. Seeing the crumpled poster, Hani had attempted to chase after him, only to have Song Kyung ignore their squabble and go back inside. In the present, Jun tries to stop Hani from counting, but she's relentless. His heart races as she blows air in his face at the count of nine, causing him to blink. Declaring victory, Hani is taken aback when Jun leans in to kiss her. But after the initial shock passes, she reciprocates, and they end up falling asleep in each other's arms. Hani wakes up the next morning, parched. Her heart skips a beat as she finds Jun asleep next to her. A blush creeps onto her cheeks as she tries to piece together the events of last night while Jun pulls her closer in his sleep, causing her to blush even more. As the memories flood back, she swears under her breath, mortified at the thought that she may have seduced Jun. She decides they must act like nothing happened. Carefully, she extricates herself from his grip and promptly falls off the bed. The noise wakes Jun, but by then, she's already out the door. Stepping outside the motel, she's still wearing Jun's clothes from last night when her phone rings. It's her best friend, Song Kyung, and the call startles her. Song Kyung asks if she spent the night with some guy, then announces she's leaving Hani's apartment. She advises Hani to use protection if it's just a fling, then hangs up. The realization hits Hani like a ton of bricks, she and Jun didn't use any protection. She rushes to the nearest pharmacy. Feeling awkward, Hani asks the pharmacist for condoms and a Chong Simwin, a Korean over-the-counter medicine to relieve anxiety. As she's about to ask for the morning after pill, Jun walks in wearing her clothes from last night, also asking for Chong Simwin. Seeing him, she bolts, but he calls her out on their clothing switch. After changing back into their own clothes, they sit outside a supermarket, eating noodles and sipping coffee. Breaking the silence, Hani asks Jun if anything happened between them, confessing she can't remember. He starts to apologize, but she insists there's no need, she's certain nothing happened, though she feels she should be the one apologizing. She warns him not to tell anyone about their motel night, especially not Song Kyung. Jun asks if she really doesn't remember anything. When she admits she was too drunk to remember, he confesses he also can't recall the details. He asks if everything is still the same between them, to which she responds, of course. As she slurps her noodles, she suggests they just forget about the whole thing. 
But Jun isn't sure he can it was his first time. He advises her to either quit drinking or only drink with someone she likes. Annoyed, Hani shoots back that she was just drunk and asks what his excuse is. He shrugs it off, reminding her that she supposedly doesn't remember anything and advises her to be more careful in the future. He finishes his coffee and stands up, mentioning he has to start his shift soon. As he leaves, she tells him to find a proper place to live instead of sleeping in classrooms. Life resumes its normal pace, but Hani can't shake the feeling that something's changed. They both throw themselves into their routines, trying to forget that night. Days later, at Donjin Books where Hani works, she reads the latest Bio manga. A romantic scene reminds her of the motel night with June. She shakes her head, telling herself to forget about it. Her boss chides her for talking to herself at work, reminding her that her paycheck comes from their loyal readers. He then asks if he's leaving early for his wife, Songkyung's birthday. He's about to dial his wife, wanting to inform her about a meeting he has, when she breezes into the office, cutting him off mid-sentence. She assures him there's no need, she doesn't plan on spending her birthday with him anyway. Instead, she suggests he let Hani off work early so they can hit the grocery store together. She adds that she's invited Jun for dinner, news that catches Hani off guard. His reaction to seeing Jun again is almost enthusiastic before he remembers his meeting. He volunteers to join them at the supermarket, but his wife stops him cold, reminding him of his other obligations. As he heads out, she calls after him, warning him not to be late. She then heads for his safe, while Hani asks if Jun knows she's coming. She admits he does, and she's just using her birthday as an excuse to feed him. She opens the safe and helps herself to her husband's cash. Hani reminds her that she already had plans for the evening, but Song Kyung shoots her a look that says she better cancel them. Hani is left in a bind the last thing she wants is to see Jun again. She warns Song Kyung that her husband might get suspicious if too much money goes missing. Deciding it's best to keep quiet, Hani lets her take the money. After all, he already knows. One day, after seeing his wife take money from the safe again, he confronts Hani. He warns her not to let this continue or he'll fire her. Her response is blunt, daring him to do it. He backs down, joking that he can't believe her audacity given their situation. Then he accuses her of being the reason he and Song Kyung are married. Hani wants to snap back, to tell him that if he hadn't been so persistent in college, Dong Jin wouldn't have misunderstood, and Song Kyung would never have married him. Instead, she advises him to talk to his wife and offer to help or change the safe's pin. His response is heavy with suspicion, unsure if Song Kyung married him for love or money. Hani tells him Song Kyung feels insecure because he doesn't want to try for kids. Regardless, he believes it's too soon to give up. He asks Hani to keep his wife's theft a secret and continue reporting to him if she wants to prevent their divorce. Song Kyung closes the safe, complaining about her domestic responsibilities. Despite having no parents or children to take care of, her husband still won't pay for his brother-in-law's tuition. She promises Hani she'll take responsibility if they get caught and urges her to continue altering the financials. Hani suggests she ask her husband for an allowance, but Song Kyung adamantly refuses. She apologizes for her outburst, ashamed that Hani has to see her like this, and breaks down thinking about her brother. Hani comforts her, reminding her that she only has a job because of Song Kyung. She should be the one feeling guilty, she thinks, considering she's playing both sides. She suggests they leave and promises to cook Jun's favorite dishes. Song Kyung hugs her, expressing her gratitude. As Hani locks up, Song Kyung tries calling Jun, but he doesn't answer. Hani assures her he's probably studying. Meanwhile, Jun sees his sister's call, ignores it, and goes back to reading his book, The Last Emergency to Success, while lying on a hospital bed. A doctor announces it's their last day and they'll be taking blood samples in an hour. The doctor adds a quick note before they leave, if they decide to bail before the trial wraps up, they'll be kissing that sweet compensation goodbye. Jun's buddy groans from his bed, clutching his gut and moaning about wanting to hurl. Jun rolls his eyes, telling him it's all in his head, and he just needs to tough it out for another hour. His friend grudgingly agrees, reminding himself that they're on the cusp of scoring $800. Suddenly, Jun's phone buzzes with a text. It's a job interview invite, scheduled between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. on the 14th. 
He quickly asks his friend what day it is, and his heart sinks when he hears it's already the 14th. A glance at the clock shows it's 4.05 p.m., leaving him less than an hour. His friend, meanwhile, lurches out of bed, struggling with his nausea. Without wasting a second, June bolts from the hospital, hailing a cab straight to the interview. He arrives just as the interviewers are packing up, grumbling about the lack of quality candidates. One of them, a stern-looking man, tells June that the interview session has ended and reminds him of the importance of punctuality. June quickly explains his late notification due to poor reception and pleads for a chance. A female interviewer flips through the applicant profiles until she finds June's. She invites him to sit, and he thanks her profusely, bowing in gratitude. Suddenly, he belches. She raises an eyebrow, asking if he's okay. He brushes it off, blaming it on nerves, and she proceeds to ask him about his perspective on working life. Caught off guard, June struggles to answer. He'd spent the night cramming on current events, his major, and the company, not this. The male interviewer calls his name, prompting him to answer. June is at a loss. What kind of question is this? What kind of answer are they expecting? If he doesn't land this job, he knows he'll be in debt. The woman asks him if he's finding the question tough, and he denies it, wondering whether they want a sincere, witty, or rapid response. Would it be a deal breaker if he admits he just needs the money? Would a textbook answer sound too fake? Suddenly, he feels nauseous again. The woman observes his discomfort, asking if he's feeling unwell. He denies it, attempting to answer the question, but instead of words, his lunch makes a surprise reappearance. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Song Kyung's house, she and Hani are setting the table when Jun calls. Song Kyung excitedly answers, only to be let down when Jun tells her he can't make it due to a last-minute assignment. Inside, Hani breathes a sigh of relief, mentally repeating, please don't come. Song Kyung hangs up, telling Hani about Jun's cancellation and wondering what to do with all the food. She decides to visit Jun, convinced something's off based on his voice. She worries he's not eating right. Hani suggests it's late and she should visit another time, secretly wondering if Jun has found a new place. Just then, Song Kyung's husband stumbles in, drunk. Song Kyung berates him for drinking on her birthday. He starts explaining but then insists that a man should be able to enjoy a business drink, even on his wife's birthday. With a dramatic flair, Song Kyung hurls her birthday cake in her husband's direction. This sets off a screaming match between the two, while Hani quietly gathers her belongings and sneaks out. All this drama has left her stomach grumbling, she hadn't even had a bite to eat. As she approaches the elevator, the doors begin to close, but Song Kyung manages to stop them with her hand. She thrusts a bag of food into Hani's hands. Initially, Hani thinks it's for her, but then Song Kyung clarifies it's for June. With her husband in his current state, she can't deliver it herself. Song Kyung pleads with Hani, giving her the big puppy dog eyes, and insists that she take the food to June. She even sends Hani Jun's address and phone number. Meanwhile, Jun is settling into his makeshift bed in a classroom, reflecting on his lousy day. He missed out on $800 from the trial, wasted 50 bucks on a cab, and flubbed his interview. On days like these, he thinks, it's best to hit the sack early. His phone rings, and seeing Hani's name on the screen, his cheeks flush pink. Hani had imagined that their reunion would be awkward, that she'd put up a cool facade. But watching Jun devour food like there's no tomorrow, she can't help but question the carefree guy in front of her. She urges him to slow down, to which he responds that birthday food is always the best. He then asks if she really took the bus all the way to his school at this late hour. As she pours him a coffee, she explains that she couldn't refuse Song Kyung's pleading and hands over the coffee, questioning if he's found a place to stay yet. Dodging her question, Jun offers her a piece of food. She refuses, brushing off his attempt to change the subject and blaming her queasy stomach on car sickness. As she continues to feel nauseous, she wonders if it's something she ate. Jun drops his chopsticks, asking if she thinks it could be morning sickness. Her reaction is immediate, she jumps up, angrily denying any possibility of pregnancy, and insists that her discomfort is due to overeating and car sickness. She then swiftly grabs her bag and heads out. Jun tries to accompany her, but she tells him to stay and call Song Kyung. 
Over the past few days, Jun found himself missing Hani and becoming curious about her. He tried to play it cool, acting as if nothing happened, but he was so anxious that he couldn't even look at her or ask how she's been. Reflecting on his chaotic interview and current state, he resolves to pull himself together and focus on job hunting. Hani finds herself camped out at a bus stop, her mind whirling with the implications of Jun's question. She chuckles to herself, dismissing his concern as an overreaction her period is just around the corner. But then, she pauses, pulling out her phone to check the date. Her heart sinks when she realizes she's late. In a flurry of panic, she recalls asking for the morning after pill and curses herself for not taking it. She bolts from the bus stop, sprinting towards the nearest pharmacy, only to find it's already closed. Undeterred, she races to another one, then another, and another, each one locked up tight. After her fifth failed attempt, she slumps on the pavement, winded and worried. Elsewhere, June's world is filled with dreams of dragon gods and magical pearls. In his sleep, he converses with the dragon god, who presents him with two pearls. When June insists they aren't his, the dragon god praises his honesty, gifting him the precious gems. Elated, June imagines selling them to pay his tuition fees. But then, the dragon god vanishes, and one of the pearls transforms into a fish, leaving June startled. His dream ends abruptly with him waking up in the library, startling his friend from the clinical trial as he demands his pearls back. He broods over the dream, unsure if it's a good or bad omen. His friend suggests it could be a sign of good news about his interview. June scoffs at the idea, his interview was a disaster, and he's sure he didn't get the job. As the sun rises, a pharmacist unlocks her shop, only to be ambushed by Hani, who pleads for a pregnancy test kit. The day draws on, and June finds himself sketching the fish and pearls from his dream, musing over their meaning, when he gets a message, he's landed the job at the cosmetics company. Overjoyed, he leaps up startling the library patrons with his cheer. Meanwhile, Hani emerges from her bathroom, staring blankly at the positive pregnancy test before sinking onto her couch. The news hits her like a ton of bricks, leaving her reeling. Days later, Sankyung receives a call from Hope Gynecology Clinic. She's not pregnant. She hangs up, feeling a pang of disappointment, only for her spirits to be lifted by another call, this one from June. He's got a job and is coming over for dinner. He encourages her to invite Hani, hinting that he has big news to share. Sangkyung rings Hani, who declines the dinner invitation, claiming she has other plans. When asked if she's seeing someone, Hani denies it and questions Jun's sudden visit. Sangkyung teases her about Jun's amazing news and insists she must come even if she's late. As Hani hangs up, she finds herself surrounded by expectant mothers in the waiting room of the clinic. She stares at her phone, wondering how to handle her situation. She remembers Jun's insistence on being fully prepared before marriage and can't bear the thought of burdening him or facing Sangkyung with this news. As the other women share stories of the challenges they face during pregnancy, Hani is left contemplating what her future holds. The women around Hani moan about how having a kid practically obliterates your chances of landing a job. But when one of their babies kicks, they all coo and gush over the little one. Hani finds it baffling. She's certain she won't go through with it. She's no rich, successful single woman. She barely scrapes by, struggling to take care of herself, let alone a child. She mutters to herself that she isn't equipped to be a mom. Her name rings out in the clinic, signaling her turn to see the doctor. As she rises, she steals herself, vowing to stand firm in her decision. In the doctor's office, the doc hits her with the news she's three weeks pregnant. The doctor calls her lucky, explaining that her low estradiol levels suggest her ovaries aren't performing their best. Getting pregnant naturally, she says, is a miracle. If Hani chooses not to keep the baby or miscarries, conceiving again might prove challenging. But she soothes Hani, assuring her that artificial insemination is always an option and has a high success rate. Later, Hani finds herself in a park, replaying the doctor's words until darkness falls. A text from June snaps her out of her thoughts. They meet at a cafe, where June excitedly presents her with a gift, announcing his new job. Overjoyed, Hani congratulates him, grabbing his hand, and speculates that Sangkyung must be thrilled. He modestly mentions it's just an internship, but to Hani, it's a step forward, and she hopes he lands a full-time position. 
As she puts two and two together, she realizes why Songkyun insisted on a dinner invite. Then Jun drops another bomb, he's moving to China. He reveals that he told Songkyung, who burst into tears, so he left before she could make a scene. The company promised him an immediate full-time position if he applied to the international division. Hani's grip on her cup tightens as she asks when he's leaving and how long he'll be gone a couple of years, he tells her. He implores her to look after Songkyung while he's away, reaching out to touch her. Hani pulls back, reminding him that Songkyung has deoxygen. Jun wishes her well and hopes she finds someone good for herself. She presses him on what he means by good, leading him to admit he means someone like her. Hani forces a smile, telling him to take care while he's away. Days later, at Hope Gynecology Clinic, Songkyung is back for another round of fertility treatment. The doctor walks her through the process, asking if she can handle it. She assures the doc she's an old hand at this. After her appointment, she calls her husband, warning him to accompany her next time or face his mother's wrath. As she heads out, she spots Hani in the reception area, which leaves her stunned. Hani tries to make a swift exit, but the nurse calls her back for her forgotten sonogram. As Hani heads back, claiming she must have dropped it, Songkyun intercepts her, demanding to know what's going on. Before Hani can spin a tail, Songkyun snatches the sonogram from her hand. In the confined space of Songkyung's car, she's examining a sonogram, brow furrowed. She throws a glance at Hani, asking if the baby daddy is the guy she'd been spotted with at the bar. Hani shakes her head, denying it, which only serves to raise Songkyung's voice. She demands to know who the father is. Hani retorts, blurting out it's not the guy next door, referencing the title of a boy's love manga she'd been engrossed in at work. Immediately, she wonders why that particular phrase popped into her head. Song Kyung, misinterpreting her words, asks if the father is her neighbor. Hani mumbles a yes, adding that they've parted ways. Song Kyung questions whether she'll be raising the child solo and begins to suggest she reconnect with the baby's dad. Hani interrupts her, exclaiming that he's moved out. When Song Kyung prompts her for his contact number, Hani reluctantly admits he's gone abroad for studies. Concern washes over Song Kyung as she queries Hani about her plans. Hani confesses she doesn't want the baby, doubting her ability to cope. Song Kyung opens up about her own struggles, revealing her ongoing fertility treatment due to a malfunctioning fallopian tube. This catches Hani off guard, as she recalls Song Kyung mentioning artificial insemination but backing out because it was too taxing. Song Kyung corrects her, stating she abandoned artificial insemination years ago but has been undergoing IVF treatment since then. Despite four attempts, she's failed to conceive, which takes Hani by surprise. She hadn't known, and Deokjin hadn't mentioned it either. Song Kyung admits Deokjin has lost interest in having kids, but she still yearns for one. Convincing him has been an uphill battle. She confesses to Hani that her guilt over their situation prevents her from directly asking Deokjin for money for Jun's tuition. She feels like she's all Jun has left, and she can't abandon him. She labels herself a terrible person, admitting the hardest part is hiding her exhaustion and pretending everything's fine. She knows if she shows any signs of crumbling, Deokjin would advise her to quit trying. Her voice breaks as she tells Hani how much she loves children, confessing her envy despite knowing it's wrong. Song Kyung urges Hani to consider discussing her situation with the baby's father instead of making decisions alone. She offers her support, promising to stand by Hani. But she warns Hani that if she chooses to abort the baby, she might not be able to forgive her. That night, Hani reflects on the doctor's words and her intense conversation with Song Kyung. Her eyes fall on Jun's gift, and she decides to open it. Inside, she finds a necklace with the engraving, K Sarah Sarah. A week later, as Song Kyung and Deokjin help Jun load his luggage into the car before heading to the airport, Song Kyung hands Jun some food and a first aid kit. While she chats with him, he dials Hani's number, but she doesn't answer. Song Kyung advises him to let Hani be, mentioning she's not been feeling well. When Jun inquires about Hani, Song Kyung brushes it off, musing whether Hani's sleeping in due to pregnancy fatigue. Jun attempts to call Hani again, but there's still no response. Song Kyung rushes him along, urging him not to miss his flight. Finally, Deokjin hands Jun a copy of the The Boy Next Door manga for his plane ride. 
As June flips through the pages, he discovers an envelope tucked inside with a note that reads, didn't have time to exchange the currency. Use it when needed. P.S. Keep this a secret from your sister. Touched, June tries to respond, but Diokjin simply winks at him, advising him to take care of the bestseller book, while Song Kyung hollers for them to get in the car. As the car rolls away, June cranes his neck, hoping to catch a glimpse of Hani. But when Hani does show up, it's too late, they're already gone. Hani, left in the dust, stomps her way home, her mind swirling with thoughts. In her heart, she knows June's departure doesn't alter anything. On her way back, a quaint flower shop catches her eye. She stops in her tracks, her gaze fixated on a rosemary plant. As she stares at it, memories of her conversation with June about marriage trickle back, and tears start to well up. The florist, noticing her, asks if the scent of rosemary is appealing to her. She turns to him, asking why people buy these plants. He shrugs, assuming she's just been dumped, and suggests that maybe it's because they're simply beautiful. Hani questions him further, asking if it could really be that straightforward. The florist nods, saying that sometimes the simplest things hold the answer. Hani looks back at the rosemary, admitting that she's no green thumb. If anything, she's the grim reaper of plants. They'd probably have lived longer, happier lives if she'd left them at the store. She ponders out loud whether it would be better not to grow one at all, given her track record. The florist, hearing this, asks her if the plants don't bring her joy. He admits that yes, they could die, but if they thrive, they'll bloom beautiful flowers and even bear fruit. He tells her that if we let fear stop us from trying, we'll never witness the beauty that tomorrow holds. He encourages her to touch the rosemary, saying it loves human contact. As Hani reaches out, the sound of a plane overhead grabs her attention. She glances up, deciding then and there to give the plant a shot. Fast forward two months to Beijing. June is parked in the underground lot of Smile Home Shopping, munching on his lunch as he waits for someone to exit the building. The day before, he'd overheard his boss and his boss's boss discussing their plans to break into the home shopping industry, lamenting the need for more funding from headquarters. His boss's boss had instructed his boss to arrange a meeting with the MD before they head back to Korea. But getting in touch with the MD is a challenge. His boss's boss didn't want to hear it, though, and insisted on having the meeting arranged within three days. Once the big boss left, June's boss turned to him, instructing him to secure a meeting with the MD by any means necessary, even if it meant stalking. He warns June not to engage the MD, but to call him so he can do the talking. June was taken aback, asking his boss if he was serious. His boss pointed out that June was a single guy in his 20s while he was a family man in his 30s, asking June if he thought it would be better for him to be waiting around instead of going home to his wife and kids. Now, June sits in his car, staring at the MD's photo and wondering how much longer he'll have to wait. As he reaches to turn up the heat in his car because of the cold, another car rear-ends him. He gets out, rubbing his sore neck, and inspects the damage to his car a sizable dent. A girl steps out of the other car, speaking in Chinese, asking if he's okay. The beautiful girl hands him her card, apologizing for the rush. When the girl hands him her card and starts to walk away, Jun grabs her hand. He tells her that he's in a bind. The car isn't his, it's a company car, and returning it with a dent would land him in hot water. She asks if he's Chinese, and he shakes his head, admitting he's Korean. To his surprise, she invites him to follow her in Korean. He asks if she speaks Korean, and she nods, explaining as they step into an elevator that she picked up a bit during business trips to Korea. Jun nervously asks where they're going. Applying lipstick, she admits, in broken Korean, that she's running late for a show. But if he waits, she'll make it up to him. She introduces herself as Yenapang. As they pass by a massive banner of Smile Home Shopping featuring her photo, June follows her in. Turns out, Yenapang is a record-breaking sales host for Smile Home Shopping. In just three years, she became the number one host, known for selling out entire product lines. Yenapang leads June to the event she's hosting, where the MD hurriedly ushers her on stage. Thanks to Yenapang, June smoothly transitions to life in China, spending the next four years there. Back in Korea, Hani is at her mother's gate, pleading for her to open up as heavy snow falls around them. Song Kyung urges Hani to call it a day, worried about the cold affecting the baby. But Hani persists, 
begging her mother to hear her out. When the gate finally opens, it's Hani's father who steps out. Surprised, Hani asks when he returned. He shares that he came back after hearing about her mother's collapse, which brings Hani to tears. He tells her he stands by her mother's decision about the pregnancy, she needs to bring the baby's father into the picture. He insists they won't speak to her until she does, and advises her to go home. Despite Song Kyung's pleas, he gently pats her shoulder and retreats indoors. Hani shakes the gate, assuring her father that she can raise the baby herself. She begs for them to listen. Song Kyung holds her as she sobs. Hani points out that she accepted their decision to live separately for the past decade, so why can't they accept hers? Song Kyung offers to let Hani live with her. She even spoke to Deokjin about it. Hani can stay in Jun's old room and she won't be alone. This touches Hani. Song Kyung reminds Hani of how she has always been there for her in tough times, like when her dad passed away. If it hadn't been for Hani, Song Kyung admits she wouldn't have been able to keep going while taking care of Seonjin. She assures Hani that she is family. Then she shouts loud enough for Hani's father to hear, promising she'll take care of Hani. On the other side of the gate, Hani's father silently thanks Song Kyung. Tears well up in his eyes as he thinks of the guy who had the audacity to leave the country after getting his darling Hani pregnant. Over in Beijing, June is locked onto the show's opening scene. Yen Peng is front and center, showcasing a moisturizing face mask. She slathers it on her face and even gives her arms a swipe to prove its full body benefits. The crew on set are all gaga over her. They're convinced that Yen Peng's charm will make the product fly off the shelves. Whispers float around that everyone wants a piece of her success. Yen Peng is basically a star in her own right. June can't help but marvel at the power she wields. One word from her sends the phone lines into overdrive. If only she could work her magic on his company's products. Meanwhile, in Korea, Song Kyung is on the phone with Hani, urging her to pack up and come over for dinner. Hani, still sniffly from the cold she caught earlier, declines. She insists she can manage on her own. Song Kyung challenges her, asking if her ego is really worth more than her health right now. Hani's about to be a mom, after all. She needs to face reality. But Hani is reluctant to impose. Just before, Hani's dad had asked Song Kyung for her bank details. He wanted to send some money each month for his daughter's upkeep, but only under the condition that Hani stays in the dark until she reveals who the baby's father is. Song Kyung spills the beans to Hani that Deokjin has invited her to move in with them. He wants her to rest and recover so she can get back to work after having the baby. This news both touches and surprises Hani. On the other side of town, Deokjin pulls up at a red light. His mind wanders back to the morning he spotted Hani and June leaving a motel. They looked suspicious, and he couldn't shake off the feeling that something was up. Now, with Hani's pregnancy, the timing seems to line up. He can't just sit back and let her struggle alone, especially if she's carrying his potential nephew or niece. He's certain Jun wouldn't have jetted off to China if he knew about the baby. But what if he confronts Jun and it turns out Jun isn't the father? Or even worse, if he is the father, Song Kyung would be livid when she finds out. Deokjin decides it's better to steer clear of the drama. It's not his problem, after all. Back in Beijing, as the show wraps up, every single product has been snapped up. Yenipang wraps up the show amid cheers and applause, snapping Jun back to reality. He needs to find the MD. He scans the room, but the MD is nowhere in sight. Yenipang beckons him over, and he trails behind her, trying to catch her attention. She assures him she'll call the insurance company about their earlier fender bender. Jun quickly clarifies that he doesn't need money, he needs to meet the MD. Yenipeng raises an eyebrow, accusing him of staging the accident to get a meeting. Jun reminds her that she was the one who rear-ended him, earning a quick apology from her. As she steps into the elevator, she shrugs, saying she can't help him. He tells her he'll go look for the MD himself, but she informs him that the MD has already left for his next meeting. With a heavy sigh, Jun follows her into the elevator. Yenipeng looks at him and asks if he really knows what he's getting himself into. She tells him the market is like a shark tank, and the little bit of cash he'd get for his car doesn't hold a candle to the kind of money that changes hands just to get a meeting with the MD. 
She then throws out a word in Chinese that translates to amateur, which gets under his skin. He's half tempted to give her a piece of his mind, remind her he's been around the block a few more times than she has, but he bites his tongue. She checks in with him again, making sure he doesn't need a hospital visit. She doesn't want any future headaches, after all. He waves her off, saying a call to the insurance company will do the trick. Just then, the elevator grinds to a halt, and they're plunged into darkness. Yenipeng starts hammering on the doors, hollering for help. He tries to soothe her, assuring her the lights will be back on any minute now. But she's scared, like really scared. She confesses she's terrified of dying. He's about to reassure her when the elevator gives a sudden jutter. Fast forward a couple hours, they're sitting on the elevator floor, their phone's the only source of light. They can't even call for help because there's no signal. Yenipeng voices out loud her fear of dying trapped in the elevator. He responds that he doesn't plan on kicking the bucket with a stranger. He's pretty sure help is on the way, even though he's shaking in his own boots. She asks him his name, saying she wants to know who she might die with. He calls her out, saying it's odd how someone who rakes in hundreds of thousands of dollars on live TV can get so easily spooked. She admits she's a bit of a scaredy cat, then lets out a sneeze. He hands over his jacket, introducing himself as June. He suggests they grab a bite once they're free. She takes the jacket, promising to introduce him to the MD if they make it out alive. That bit of news brightens his mood. Just then, the elevator lurches again, and she grabs onto him in fear. As if on cue, the doors slide open. Meanwhile, back in Korea, Hani is tucking in for the night at Song Kyung's place. Song Kyung tells her that she had kept Jun's room just as he left it, but maybe it was meant for Hani all along. Hani asks about Jun, and Song Kyung assures her that he's doing fine. She mentions that Jun has been asking about Hani since she never answers his calls. She advises Hani to give him a call when she can. Hani asks Song Kyung to keep her pregnancy under wraps from Jun. Song Kyung agrees but warns her that Jun will find out eventually. Back in Beijing, thanks to Yenipang, Jun's team scores a meeting with the big shot MD. In a huge win for the little guys, they secure the primetime slot on home shopping for their product launch. This propels them into the Chinese market, and even five months later, sales are still going strong. Over time, Jun and Yenipang start hanging out on weekends to practice their Chinese and Korean, becoming fast friends in the process. At one of their regular weekend hangouts, Yenipang tosses Jun a grin and tells him she loved the Korean book he'd given her. She sets down a BL manga on the table and asks if he's read it. Jun shrugs, saying he only got halfway through, but truthfully, he devoured it during a bout of boredom. Yenipang teases him, asking if he's into guys. He turns beet red and vehemently denies it. He explains that the manga was actually a project from his brother-in-law's company and translated by a buddy of his. Yenipeng can't help but laugh, calling him adorable. She asks who this friend is, and he says it's a mutual friend of his and his sister's. Yenipeng gives him a suspicious look and repeats a friend in Chinese. Meanwhile, over in Korea, Hani, now seven months pregnant, is toiling away at work. Song Kyung, who's been waiting for her to finish up, questions if she really needs to be working so hard in her condition. Hani explains to her that she's going to be a single mom, so she has to have some income. Song Kyung suggests that Hani keep working after the baby's born and let her babysit, theorizing that being around a baby might boost her own chances of getting pregnant. She also promises to stash away the money she earns from babysitting to give to Jun when he ties the knot. Suddenly, Hani winces in pain. Song Kyung asks if she's alright, and Hani tries to brush it off as nothing. But before she can finish her sentence, another wave of pain hits her, causing Song Kyung to insist they head home. Hani tries to assure her again that she's fine, but then she topples off her chair, leaving Song Kyung shouting her name in alarm. In Hani's dream, she's thrown into this surreal scenario where a little girl is bawling her eyes out and calls her mom. Now, Hani, still a teenager in her dream, is all like, wait, why am I your mom? And the kiddo just wants a hug. But Hani's like, hold up, I'm still figuring out my own life, and tries to back off. The situation escalates with the girl crying even harder, and Hani, in full panic mode, tries to escape only to bump into her own mom. Her mom's not having any of it and tells Hani it's time to face the music, she's a mom now, which totally throws Hani for a loop. 
Fast forward, and we see an adult Hani coming to terms with the title mom. Cut to reality, Hani wakes up to find her actual mom and Songkyung by her side, diving straight into apologies. But her mom is quick to snap her back to reality, especially with a contraction hitting Hani like a truck. Amidst the chaos, the doc barges in, insisting on moving Hani to surgery because, surprise, it's a risky preemie situation. As she's wheeled away, her support squad, including her dad and Dokjin, can only wait, while Songkyung shouts words of encouragement. Meanwhile, over in Beijing, Yenaping's phone is blowing up, but she's just not feeling it. June's curious if she's ghosting someone, leading to a heart-to-heart -heart where Yenaping lays it all out, she's into June and proposes they give dating a shot. June's hesitant, fearing a future split might cost them their friendship. Yenaping pulls a bold move with a kiss, setting the stakes, if June feels nothing, they stay pals, anything more, and they're officially an item. June, torn, ups for friendship, leaving Yenaping to walk away, heartbroken. As Yenaping exits, June's left wrestling with his feelings, haunted by a past fling with Hani and why she's now in Mayana's calls. He suspects she might have moved on, given her history of ghosting when involved with someone else. Despite the confusion and unresolved feelings, Jun is determined not to jump into something he can't fully commit to, reflecting on his choices and what they mean for his relationships moving forward. Right off the bat, Jun's phone lights up with Su Kyung's name. Without missing a beat, he's like, everything cool, as soon as he picks up. Su Kyung's on the other end, playing it cool, asking how he's holding up and tossing in a sorry for being MIA lately. Jun cuts to the chase, wanting to know about Hani. Su Kyung nearly drops the phone, all oh, wait, what have you heard? Jun's confused, just wants to know why Hani's ghosting him. He throws out there, she finds someone special or what? And Su Kyung hits him with, oh, she's got someone all right. Someone who'll steal your heart the minute you meet. And just like that, she hangs up. Jun's left talking to himself, thinking he's been played for a fool. If Hani's moved on, where does that leave him? Out of nowhere, Yenaping pops back in, all about second chances because, surprise, she's still got the feels for Jun. He admits he felt something too, and bam, they're on a new journey together. Fast forward three years, and we're in Korea. Cut to this adorable scene at the hospital where little Ran is giving everyone a run for their money, literally. She drops her ball, and it rolls over to this guy in a wheelchair. The guy, being a good sport, picks it up. Over at the reception, Hani and Sukiyong are having a classic kids will be kids chat, with Hani mentioning Ran's a bit of a night owl. Turns out, they're there because Ran took a tiny tumble off the bed under Sukiyong's watch. No biggie, though, just some bruises. Sukiyong's in mini panic mode when she realizes Ran's pulled a Houdini. Meanwhile, Ran's making friends with the wheelchair guy, passing him a candy for his troubles. As Hani calls out for Ran, the little adventurer makes her way back pointing at her new friend. Hani catches a glimpse of the guy rolling away, something about him ringing a bell. Sukiyang's relieved to see Ran safe, and as they're getting ready to head out, Hani's mind's on Jun, wondering if that was him. Sukiyang's skeptical, saying Jun's been off the radar, swamped with work. Little do they know, wheelchair guy is Jun, his life turned upside down after a rough month in China. All his dreams, including being a dad, seem shattered. Just a month ago, he was chillin' with Yenapang, brushing off her concerns about a business trip set up by a guy with a crush on her. He had half-jokingly asked if she expected him to throw down with her travel buddy just to make her happy. Yenapang couldn't help but chuckle, teasingly questioning if a hint of jealousy was creeping in. Why act like it doesn't bug you, she playfully prodded. June laid it out straight, look, we might have had our thing for a month, but past is past. How do you expect me to be cool with you jetting off with Mr. Raccoon over there? Yenapang's response was swift and bold, why not give their relationship another shot? She assured him she was single now. But Jun, sticking to his guns, expressed his preference for simplicity in relationships, valuing loyalty and dedication above all else. Yenapang, unfazed, insisted that despite her dating history, she's looking for the one, just like anyone else. Rewind to three years ago, Yenapang, slightly tipsy and at a bar with a guy she was seeing, decided it was time to call it quits. The guy, seeking closure, suggested a farewell kiss to cherish the memories. 
Meanwhile, June, minding his own business biking home, nearly crashes when he receives a photo of Yenipeng locking lips with someone else. Then, out of nowhere, he's approached by a guy inquiring if he's the June from Korea, leading to a rather emotional confession about not being able to live without Yenipeng. Following that encounter, Jun found himself in a bizarre situation where men kept coming up to him, some hostile, some in tears, and others hurling insults. He confided in Yenipeng that he'd rather take a beating than witness such scenes. Yenipeng, clearly frustrated, explained that she had ended things with these guys and was clueless about how they got to Jun. She also mentioned that some were merely fans whose affections she didn't reciprocate. Yenipeng accused Jun of being closed off, to which he internally disagreed. Witnessing these confrontations made him realize how much Yenipeng was adored, recognizing her need for love. Despite her warning that he was on the verge of losing her, and her hints at a possible proposal during her business trip, Jun couldn't suppress his jealousy. He proposed she return to Korea with him, but she refused. Acknowledging his inability to handle a long-distance relationship due to his jealousy, Jun suggested a platonic relationship, likening Yenipeng to a younger sister, a comment that did not sit well with her. Days later, during a meeting with a man Yenipeng traveled with, Jun discovered that his proposal had been rejected. The conversation awkwardly shifted back to work matters, only for Jun to be blindsided by the man's denial of any prior agreement regarding a new product broadcast, leaving Jun in utter disbelief. Jun found himself in a bit of a predicament, trying to remind a colleague about their previously agreed upon deal. You know how these things can go, what's agreed upon in one moment can suddenly become hazy memory the next. Unfortunately for June, when he tried to press the issue, the conversation took an unexpected turn. The colleague, rather than acknowledging the agreement, decided to up the ante with a bet involving Yenipeng. Now, that's corporate rivalry with a personal twist. Back at headquarters, the atmosphere was tense. The stakes were high, and June's boss made it crystal clear, the China branch was on thin ice, and if this deal fell through, it would spell disaster for everyone involved. It was one of those moments where the weight of responsibility feels both humbling and heavy. June, feeling the heat, committed to doing whatever it took to ensure the branch remained operational. Driven by a mix of determination and frustration, June opted for an unconventional approach. He hit the streets, setting up a makeshift stall to sell their products directly to consumers. It was a bold move, showcasing a blend of entrepreneurial spirit and sheer willpower. This grassroots effort attracted attention, both positive and negative. While customers were drawn to his pitch, two individuals saw his presence as an infringement, leading to a confrontation that unfortunately ended with June in the emergency room. On the flip side, Yenipeng faced her own set of challenges. Her business partner, unhappy about the unfolding events, threatened to sever ties, which could have detrimental effects on their program. In a display of quick thinking and negotiation skills, Yenipeng managed to turn the situation around. She secured an exclusive contract, ensuring their company maintained its competitive edge, all while advocating for June's company in the process. In a moment that felt like it was straight out of a modern-day fable, June found himself in the grips of a vivid dream. There he was, face to face with a dragon god who was all about doling out life advice. The main takeaway? Happiness is something you've got to chase down yourself, it won't just land in your lap. Typical dream stuff, right? But it resonated with June, leaving him with plenty to ponder as he navigated his waking life. As reality snapped back into focus, June was greeted by the not-so-comfortable reality of his situation, underscored by a significant amount of discomfort. Yenipeng, ever the voice of reason, suggested upping the painkillers, a practical solution for an immediate problem. It was clear from the get-go that Jun's situation warranted more than just temporary fixes. Enter Jun's boss, who, with a mix of concern and pragmatism, steered the conversation towards a more durable solution, surgery back in Korea. The revelation of needing an artificial testicle threw Jun for a loop, a curveball he wasn't expecting but had to catch nonetheless. The situation escalated when Jun learned about Yenipeng's bold move to sign an exclusive contract to secure a deal for his company. It left him in a bind, wrestling with gratitude and guilt. Here was Yenipeng, making significant sacrifices, and Jun couldn't help but feel conflicted about the implications of her actions. Fast forward to the surgery in Korea, the procedure went as planned, but it left Jun staring down the barrel of potential infertility, a daunting prospect to say the least. 
Despite the uncertainty, there was a silver lining, the situation wasn't a permanent one. After the dock took off, June was left stewing in his own thoughts, worrying about how he might never get to be a dad and his frustration over work. His boss dropped in with some less than stellar news. Despite snagging that primetime slot, sales were kind of a letdown. To make matters worse, their rivals decided to crash the party with similar products, kicking off a full-blown price war. When June pressed for details about HQ's take on the debacle, his boss laid it out, HQ was looking for a fall guy, and guess who they picked? June. The conversation took a nosedive from there. June brought up the verbal agreement they had, but his boss was more focused on the extra workload caused by June's injury. He tried to play the sympathy card, mentioning his own kids and how June, still young, could bounce back. But June wasn't having any of it. I'm 31, he shot back, laying bare his frustrations about being single, barely scraping together a security deposit after paying off his student loans, and feeling like his 20s just zipped by. The past four years? Poured into the company, and now this? His boss, probably sensing June was at his breaking point, dangled the severance pay again, hinting it was better than walking away empty-handed. The call ended with a promise to ship June's stuff whenever he wanted. But for June, that was the last straw. His phone met the floor with a thud, a casualty of his boiling anger. And just like that, all the stress and penned-up feelings came rushing out. It's not like June had sky-high ambitions, his dreams were pretty down-to-earth. Pay off his loans, secure a little nest egg, maybe find someone special, and start a family. After meeting Ran, the idea of being a dad wasn't just a nice thought, it felt like a calling. But here he was, sacrificing his best years for a brighter future, only to end up with a body that felt broken. Back in the present, June's caught up in a moment of reflection, wondering about the trials and tribulations he's faced without ever really knowing what lay ahead. As he observes the ants bustling through the hospital garden, a sudden realization hits him. Maybe this journey wasn't the one he had envisioned for himself, but it's high time he gives himself some credit. He's ready to embrace life's simpler joys, to live a little more freely. And with that, he decides it's time for a fresh start, beginning with a break from work, a new haircut, and a clean shave as he prepares to head home in search of happiness. Switching scenes, we find Songkyun and Deokjin at the zoo with Ran perched atop Deokjin's shoulders. Amidst their leisurely day out, Deokjin suggests waking Hani for dinner, but Songkyun opts to let her rest, redirecting their attention to the animals, much to Ran's delight. Suddenly, Songkyung's phone rings with an unknown caller on the other end, it's June, surprising her with the news that he's right outside her apartment. A mix of shock and annoyance bubbles up as she scolds him for not giving her a heads up, all while accidentally letting go of Rand's balloon. She guides June to her apartment, sharing the passcode for entry. Inside, Hani is awakened by the commotion of June's arrival. Hearing the shower and suspecting Sangkyung couldn't have returned so soon, Hani investigates, only to find unfamiliar clothes and shoes strewn about. Approaching the bathroom door with caution, she's startled by the sight of Jun's suitcase, mistaking the occupant for a thief. In a panic, she arms herself with an umbrella, poised for confrontation, only to freeze when Jun steps out and greets her by name. The tension dissolves into an emotional reunion. Hani, overwhelmed, questions why Jun is there, tears streaming down her face as Jun warmly declares he's back for good. Meanwhile, on their drive home, Deokjin and Songkyung mull over Jun's first meeting with Ran and the dynamics between Hani and Jun. Despite Deokjin's playful nudging for Songkyung to make herself up for Jun's return, Songkyung insists there's no need for formalities among family though she realizes she forgot to inform Hani about Jun's comeback. Back at the apartment, June and a flustered Hani sit across from each other, navigating the awkwardness of their reunion. June chides her for not reaching out during his absence. She sidesteps his question, diving straight into asking about the company's situation. He hints at waiting for everyone to arrive before explaining, and she instantly senses trouble brewing. As he inquires if she's just visiting her sister, she drops the bombshell that she's actually been living there, squatting in his old room. Curious, he wonders about her place and where he's supposed to crash now. Despite her protests, he barges into the room, now a playground of toys and books. Amidst her frantic tidying, he spots a picture of Ran, sparking his curiosity about the familiar-looking child. June can't shake off the feeling he's seen Ran before. Hani reluctantly introduces Ran as her daughter, leaving June reeling. 
Before he can dig deeper, Song Kim and an excited Ran burst in, sharing tales of a zoo adventure and initiating a warm family hug. The conversation quickly turns to why Jun hasn't married yet, with Song Kim playfully chiding him, much to his embarrassment. Song Kim's casual mention of Jun not knowing Ran sends him into a whirlwind of questions about Hani's marital status and whether he's been left out of the loop. As they all gather for dinner, Jun drops the bomb that he's resigned, aiming for a break filled with home comforts and family time, despite the initial shock and confusion it causes. The mood shifts to light-hearted as Gyokjin arrives with supplies for a feast, suggesting they kickstart Jun's sabbatical right away. Amidst plans for a sibling night out, Jun finds solace in little Rand's company, stunned to realize she's the child he once met in the hospital. The revelation leads to more questions, but as the grill heats up and wine is sought, Hani whisks Ran away for a bath, leaving Jun amidst a whirlwind of emotions and unanswered questions. Leaning back, Jun starts piecing together Ran's age puzzle. He casually asks Songkyung about Ran's birthday, getting May 25th as the answer. Then, he dives into some mental gymnastics, comparing dates and possibilities. If Ran was his, he figures, she'd have a July birthday. Memories of Atiri Hani lamenting over a man during a drunken night flash through his mind. Was that guy the father? Did he leave Hani to marry someone else, or did Hani not even realize she was pregnant then? Jun remembers asking Hani about morning sickness once, and her reaction was almost like she had no clue. Curiosity peaked, he probes Songkyung about Hani's mysterious husband, learning he was the neighbor but gets a talk to Hani for anything more. That's all the nudge Jun needs, he announces he's stepping out, leaving Songkyung and the newly arrived Deokjin questioning his sudden interest in Hani's past love life. As Hani steps in, wondering where Jun's vanished to, Deokjin, ever the playful uncle, suggests to Ran they should go find him, hinting maybe Hani should be the one to actually do it. Despite Songkyung's suggestion to wait for Jun's return, Hani decides to take up the search. Meanwhile, Jun's at the playground, lost in bought on a swing, He's stuck on the idea Hani might have left Rand's dad because he was a divorcee. He can't help but wonder if he's somehow to blame, feeling like he missed something major. Then Hani finds him, and they dive into a heart-to-heart. -heart. June's all over the place, asking Hani about their past, questioning Rand's dad's whereabouts, and whether the guy even knows he has a daughter. Hani tries to explain, hinting she didn't cling to Rand's dad as he was moving on. Jun's mind races, mistakenly thinking Dong Jin must be the dad, but Hani swiftly corrects him, trying to ease his worries. She grabs his hand, asking if he still dreams of fatherhood. His no hits her hard, especially when he adds he doesn't believe he has the right to be a dad anymore, silently admitting to himself it's because he can't have kids. He mentions he's thinking of using his time off to figure out what he really wants to do with his life. Hani gets up, mentioning she's cold and heading inside. He offers to join her, but she snaps at him not to, catching him off guard. When he reaches out to her, she pulls back, complaining of a headache and asking him to come by later. He watches her go, mulling over the thought that her anger might mean she broke up with Dong Jim because of him. Back home, Song Kyung gives him a bit of a scolding for taking off as she's setting up dinner. He inquires about Hani and Ran, learning Hani's putting Ran to bed. Deokjin hands Jun a glass of wine, curious about his chat with Hani. Song Kyun interjects, saying there shouldn't be anything new for them to discuss, but Deokjin playfully suggests there's plenty for two old friends to catch up on. That earns him a slap from Song Kyung. Jun just wanted to know about Hani's husband, he explains. Song Kyung shares that the guy was Hani's neighbor but went abroad, and now she can't find any info on him. Jun starts pondering if he should look for Rant's dad, while Deokjin wonders if he should get involved. Song Kyung tells Jun to eat and asks where he plans to sleep. She suggests the sofa for now, wondering aloud about their living arrangements since the house is crowded and she can't ask Hani to leave. Deokjin jokes about kicking Song Kyung out so he and Jun can share a room. Meanwhile, Hani, lying in bed with her daughter, sheds a few tears. Late at night, a tipsy Jun gets up to use the bathroom and ends up sleeping next to Hani and her daughter by mistake. The next morning, Song Kyung barges in, waking them and demanding Jun leave the room. In the living room, Jun, now on his knees, apologizes for the mix-up, getting scolded by Song Kyung. Hani steps in, reminding them it's actually Jun's room. She then surprises everyone by suggesting she should move out soon, thinking it's time to give Jun his room back. She internally apologizes to Song Kyung, feeling guilty for overstaying. 
Despite her readiness to leave, Songkyun insists Hani stay till her apartment lease is up at year's end, even though June returned early. June breaks the news that he's thinking of moving out soon, hoping to crash with Songkyun until he figures out his next move. Songkyun, not having any of it, tells him to zip it and focus on job hunting instead. She's baffled by his plan to dip into his savings while jobless, urging both Hani and June to drop the topic. She then nudges Hani, reminding her they're running late. Hani gets up to give Ran a bath, leaving June to ponder if his moving plans are pushing Hani away. He decides he needs to find a new place stat, to avoid causing more stir. Wandering the neighborhood later, June is hit by sticker shock at the local housing prices. Mulling over a potential move to the suburbs, given his tight budget, he strolls past a daycare named Kidsland. Realizing it might be Rand's daycare, he takes a peek over the fence. Spotting Ran, he tries to catch her attention but ends up chatting with another kid instead. This kid, after hearing June's inquiry about Ran, labels her as the kid with no dad, leaving June stunned. As the boy fetches Ran, June reels from the comment. Ran, recognizing June, excitedly asks for a lift home. When June suggests waiting till daycare ends, Ran bursts into tears, prompting him to hop the fence and comfort her. During their interaction, the same boy returns, questioning June's relation to Ran. Despite Ran's claims of having a dad, the boy taunts her, leading June to defensively tap the boy on the head, claiming he's Ran's dad. This escalates quickly, drawing a teacher's attention. Faced with an inquiry, June asserts he's Ran's father, a statement that confuses the teacher and deeply moves him. Meanwhile, Hani's at work, pondering her living situation, when she's blindsided by a call from Ran's teacher. The teacher reports an incident involving Ran's father, who allegedly struck a child, sparking outrage from the child's mother. Hani is shocked, unable to fathom who could have posed as Ran's father. Next scene, Jun meets up with a real estate agent to snoop on who lived next to Hani about four years back. The agent's like, dude, how am I supposed to remember anything from four years ago? But Jun's all, please, it's super important. The agent, rubbing his temple, mentions it's been ages since those records were relevant and kind of hints that Jun's being a bit of a pain. While half complaining, the agent checks his computer and spills that apartment 706, the one next to Hani's old place, has been empty for ages. Describes it as a bit of a dump, really, but when he mentions it's cheap, June's ears perk up. How cheap are we talking, he asks, suddenly interested. Switching scenes to Rant's daycare, Hani's there smoothing things over after June's little incident. The teacher's actually apologizing back, saying the other kids started the waterworks and that the mom's not pressing it. Then, out of nowhere, she starts raving about how much Ran looks like her dad, aka June, leaving Hani awkwardly laughing and wondering what June's up to. At dinner time, Ran refuses to eat unless June does the honors. When he steps in, she eats like there's no tomorrow, leaving Hani and Sangkyung speechless. Post-dinner, Hani's in the bathroom fretting over Ran getting too attached to June when her phone rings. Meanwhile, June's tucking Ran in on the couch when Songkyung comes in, warning him not to play dad unless he plans to stick around. She's worried about Ran getting hurt in the long run. June can't help but defend how adorable Ran is, prompting Songkyung to suggest he quit his break, get a job, and settle down. Their chat gets cut short when June whispers about moving out soon, shocking Songkyung enough to drop her bottle. That's when Hani walks in, announcing she's got her housing sorted so June can have his room back. This leads to a bit of a standoff, with Songkyung threatening them dramatically until they promise to visit every weekend. Fast forward a week, and June's moving out as planned. Hani figures it's for the best, hoping for some peace and quiet. She moves out a few days later too. While cleaning her new place, she chats with Songkyung on the phone, who's venting about Deokjin being MIA again. Hanging up, Hani asks Jun, who's been helping her clean, if he's up for some Jujangnian, and he's totally on board. As she's scanning the menu, trying to decide how much food to order, Jun heads for the door. Where are you off to? She asks, a bit puzzled. He tells her he's just going back to his place to freshen up and that she should go ahead and order. He'll be back in 10 minutes. Before she can even react, he's out the door. She dashes after him, only to find the hallway empty. Then, out of nowhere, he pops his head out from the apartment next door, saying, don't forget the sweet and sour pork, before disappearing again. 
Hande's left standing there, mouth agape, as it dawns on her that Jun is now her next door neighbor. When the food finally arrives, Hani watches Jun get everything ready, feeling a mix of nervousness and confusion. She's trying to figure out what to do with him living so close when he suggests they keep things neighborly, helping each other out like in the old days. She questions why he moved without giving her a heads up, and he simply responds, surprise. He also makes her promise not to tell his sister, wanting it to be a surprise for when she drops off Ran later. Hani's mind races, thinking about how she moved to avoid June, but now finds a strange sense of relief knowing he's next door. Their calm moment is broken when June starts to pour sauce over the pork. What are you doing? We need to dip it, she exclaims. June insists on pouring, leading to a playful argument over dipping versus pouring. They lock eyes in a standoff until June backs down, letting her dip to her heart's content. Trying to lighten the mood, Hani teases him about being sulky and offers to split the dishes so he can pour his sauce. As she wipes some crumbs from his face, she jokingly calls him a kid, then pauses, noticing for the first time the similarities between him and Ran. June bats her hand away, saying, stop it, and goes back to pouring his sauce, declaring, men bulldoze. In response, Hani flicks a piece of radish pickle at him, sparking a playful chase that ends with her hiding under her bed covers, giggling and apologizing. June pulls the blanket away, and they tumble off the bed, landing in a heap, faces flushed and hearts racing. They share a nostalgic moment, reminiscent of their childhood games of hide and seek with Song Kyung. Just then, June feels a sharp pain where he had surgery, causing him to wince. Hani, concerned, offers to help, thinking it's just indigestion. But as she tries to rub his back, he insists she stop, pleading internally for her not to touch him. Misunderstanding his reaction, she gets upset, asking if he thinks she's a pervert and tells him to go home. As she starts clearing up, Song Kyung calls to say she's arrived with Ran. Jun makes his way downstairs, catching Hani's attention. Was that Song Kyung who just left? He asks. He then tells her he's heading back to his place but if his sister shows up looking for him, Hani should bring her over for a surprise visit. Hani, concerned, asks about his earlier discomfort. In response, Jun pulls her into a hug, apologizing for his outburst and promising it won't happen again before he heads out. In the elevator, Song Kyung, with Ran in tow, can't help but eye the blonde woman standing with them, silently wondering if she's someone famous. When they reach the seventh floor, where Hani lives, the blonde Yenapang also steps out and heads straight to Jun's door, ringing the bell. Song Kyung, now outside Hani's apartment, rings the bell too, curious about Yenapang being possibly a neighbor. Hani opens the door, hoisting an excited Ran into her arms. Song Kyung's about to ask about Jun when he suddenly pops out of his apartment yelling surprise, only to freeze at the sight of Yenapang instead of his sister. His gaze flits between a shocked Song Kyung and Yenapang. Song Kyung, surprised, questions Yenapang's identity as Jun gets hugged by Yenapang, who exclaims she finally found him. Once everyone settles in Hani's apartment, Song Kyung airs her grievances about Jun not informing her of his move next door. Jun tries to lighten the mood, asking if it's not a pleasant surprise. The conversation shifts to Yenapang and how she knew where to find Jun, leading to a confession from Yenapang about her efforts to track him down due to his unresponsiveness. Song Kyung, whispering to Hani, speculates on the nature of Jun and Yenapang's relationship, to which Hani agrees there seems to be something. Yenapang introduces herself, crediting Jun for her Korean skills, which earns Jun a pointed look from Song Kyung. Yenapang then mentions teaching Jun Chinese, prompting Song Kyung to tease him about hiding his acquaintance with such a beautiful friend. Ran, feeling jealous, tugs at Jun's shirt, declaring him as her daddy, which surprises everyone. Jun reassures Ran, causing a bit of a stir, but Hani decides to intervene, taking Ran away as she cries for her daddy. Song Kyung tries to clarify the situation to Yenapang, who finds Ran adorable and likens her to Jun, much to Song Kyung's amusement. Song Kyung, seizing the moment, suggests Jun take Yenapang out, offering her car for their use. As Yenapang and Jun leave, Song Kyung comments on Yenapang's manners and looks, while Hani, holding Ran, remains nonchalant about Yenapang's profession. Back in Jun's apartment, Yenapang checks on Jun's well being. He assures her he's fine and inquires about her. Yenapang reveals her concerns about Jun quitting his job because of her, but he reassures her it was for other reasons, urging her not to worry. Yenapang, however, confronts him about lying, sharing her realization of her feelings for him after his departure. 
Yenipeng throws a curveball at Jun, suggesting they might have to call it quits on being just friends, and even muses about relocating to Korea for him. But Jun's quick to shut that down, pointing out how much she digs her current gig, not to mention his own health has seen better days, making the whole relationship thing a no-go for him. Yenipeng, undeterred, floats the idea of hooking Jun up with a job, while casually brushing his shoulder, assuring him that his physical state doesn't faze her one bit. They share this loaded glance, and just as Yenipeng leans in for a kiss, Jun's hit with a wave of pain down there. Trying to keep it together, Jun twists away as Yenipeng checks in on him, guessing correctly that it's his surgery site acting up. When she offers to take a look, Jun's face goes all shades of red. He gently rebuffs her, suggesting a moment to regroup before he drops her home. Over at Hani's place, Rance dropping some heavy feels, wishing out loud to shack up with daddy Jun Hani does her best to set the record straight, explaining that Jun's actually her uncle, not dad. The conversation quickly turns into a tearjerker, with Ran apologizing and Hani admitting to a bout of jealousy. They exchange heartfelt assurances, promising no more tears or talk of missing daddy. Right then, the doorbell rings and in walks Jun with Yenipeng, looking for Song Kyung's car keys. Hani tries to play off her puffy eyes as nothing more than a big yawn, but Jun's not buying it. He probes, worried something's up with Ran. Hani brushes him off, though Yenipeng's watching this exchange like it's primetime drama, picking up on vibes between Jun and Hani that maybe even they haven't clocked yet. As Hani fetches the keys, Yenipeng can't help but quiz Jun about his and Hani's connection, right as Hani walks back in. Jun shushes Yenipeng, takes the keys, and reassures himself about Ran before being ushered out by Hani, with Yenipeng tagging along, already planning their next visit. Meanwhile, Song Kyung's making her way home, mulling over the day's events, when a chat with Ran's teacher drops. The teacher shares how Ran's been on the up and up since her dad swung by. Song Kyung corrects her, Jun's the cool uncle, not dad. The conversation takes a turn when the teacher pitches setting Hani up with her recently single brother, piquing Song Kyung's interest. Later, Song Kyung's on the phone trying to sell Hani on this blind date idea, but Hani's having none of it, even with the guy reportedly being a hit with kids. Song Kyung pulls out all the stops, but Hani stands firm, ending the call. Left alone, Hani glances at the clock, noting it's nearing midnight and June's still out. The next morning, Hani's phone buzzes her awake. It's Song Kyung on the line, immediately diving into apologies, which has Hani sitting straight up. Song Kyung spills that she might have set Hani up on a blind date for noon at a local cafe, convinced Hani would be cool with it. Hani, not so cool with it, pushes back, but Song Kyung, in her persuasive way, begs her to give it a shot. When Hani wonders about Ran, Song Kyung suggests roping in Jun for babysitting duty and tells Hani to glam up before swiftly ending the call. Next, Song Kyung rings Jun, who's groggily dealing with the aftermath of last night. She quickly instructs him to watch over Ran, ignoring his questions and hanging up. Jun, grumbling about Song Kyung's abruptness, gets ready and is taken aback when Hani shows up at his door, looking stunning. She asks if he could watch Ran for a bit. When she mentions the blind date, Jun hides his surprise, casually advising her not to stay out too long. Hani quips about his late return the previous night, shutting down any explanation from him and heads off, bumping into Yenipeng on her way to the elevator. Yenipeng throws a compliment Hani's way before darting back to Jun inside the elevator, Hani can't help but wonder if she's still capable of feeling butterflies. Meanwhile, back at Hani's place, Jun settles in with a still sleeping Ran. Yenipeng, curious, quizzes Jun about their resemblance, even joking about Ran potentially being his daughter. Jun laughs it off, but seems intrigued by Yenipeng's observations about their similar features. At the cafe, Hani waits past noon, getting ready to leave when Dong Jin unexpectedly calls out to her. They shake hands, both revealing they were waiting for someone. Deciding to wait together, Dong Jin awkwardly brings up their last motel encounter, leading to a blush from Hani. Conversation flows, and Dong Jin admits he's there for a blind date, mirroring Hani's reason. The realization that they are each other's dates dawns on them. Back in Hani's apartment, Jun is trying to reach Song Kyung, pacing with worry. When Song Kyung finally picks up, Jun bombards her with questions about Ran's birth, specifically if she was premature. Song Kyung, puzzled and a bit annoyed by the timing of the call, confirms Ran's prematurity and wonders why Jun's asking. Song Kyung's on the line with Jun, laying down the law about not pestering Hani, especially now since she's out on a blind date. 
Jun's curiosity gets the better of him, and he tries to pry into Hani's whereabouts, but Song Kyung's having none of it. She suggests Jun focus on Yenapeng instead, maybe even take her out on a date. Jun, clearly not satisfied but hitting a brick wall, ends the call and starts dialing Hani's number in a frenzy. Meanwhile, Yenapeng's watching Jun with a mix of confusion and concern, especially after his reaction to the whole premature baby talk. She reckons there's a lot Jun's itching to find out. Cut to Hani and Dong Jin, who are deep in nostalgia over their college days. Dong Jin throws a curveball, asking Hani about their first meeting, and she spills the beans about falling for him at first sight, instantly wishing she could take the words back. Dong Jin's taken aback, admitting he had no clue. Hani tries to brush it off as ancient history, confessing he was her first love. Dong Jin's pretty chuffed by the revelation, telling her his heart's just starting to flutter. Back at Hani's place, Jun's still on the phone marathon, getting nowhere. Yenapeng tells him to give it a rest and wait till Hani gets home. That's when Ran wakes up, mistaking Jun for her dad, which hits him right in the feels, admitting through tears he's her dad, not her uncle, and pulls her into a hug. Ran's next announcement is a bathroom emergency, prompting a swift reaction from Jun. Yenapeng's trying to piece together the puzzle, convinced Jun's playing the dad card because Ran's just too adorable. She refuses to buy into the theory that Ran might actually be Jun's daughter, thinking if it turns out true, Jun could just play the financial support card. But deep down, she's ready to fight for Jun, regardless of the new developments. Over at the cafe, Dong Jin and Hani's trip down memory lane takes a twist when Dong Jin mentions how everyone thought she was off the market back in college, thanks to Deokjin. Hani clarifies that Deokjin ended up with her friend, not her. Dong Jin reflects on all the missed opportunities because of those rumors. Their chat takes another unexpected turn when a man approaches Hani, introducing himself as her actual blind date, throwing suspicious glances Dong Jin's way. Just then, Dong Jin's phone buzzes, and a girl nearby calls out to him, revealing herself as his real date. She questions why they've been together for an hour, leading to some awkward explanations. Dong Jin ushers Hani to go on with her date, whispering they'll catch up later, and Hani whispers back in agreement. Her date is clearly miffed she didn't hang around waiting for him since he was running late. He jumps to conclusions, asking if she was with another guy. She's not having any of it and fires back, saying Dong Jin was just an old college buddy and points out the cheek of him being all accusatory when he rocked up an hour late. He tries to brush it off with a cocky sorry and suggests they hit up another spot. She's like, nope, got to get back to my kid. He tries to play it off like she's making excuses because apparently, she's his type and insists on grabbing a bite. Despite her protests, he's set on heading to a restaurant he's booked and starts walking off. Meanwhile, Dong Jin's got his own drama unfolding. While keeping an eye on Hani, his own date's hinting at a second meetup, but he's politely bowing out. Then, in a twist, he stops Hani from taking off with her less than charming date, leaving her pretty stunned. He gets all serious, saying bouncing now would be a major regret for him. Cut to Hani's place, where Yenapang's doing a cute hairdo for Ran and talks about wanting to bond by hitting the amusement park together, promising cotton candy and toys. Jun's there but mentions he'll have to leave soon. Just then, Song Kyung walks in, and Ran's all excited. Song Kyung's thankful to Yenapeng for watching Ran and nudges her about going on her date with Jun Jun, looking all intense, demands the blind date location from Song Kyung, who's baffled by his sudden interest. He blurts out it's because he can't reach Hani and has something crucial to discuss. After a bit of back and forth, he drops the bombshell that he might have found Ran's dad, snagging the location out of a shocked Song Kyung. Back at the cafe, things are heating up. Dong Jin's trying to convince Hani to stay put, which is when his date, fed up, drenches him and storms off. Hani's date is lost, wondering what on earth is going on. Hani feels bad, saying she can't leave with him. Dong Jin, trying to play the peacemaker, ends up taking a punch meant for his face. Meanwhile, Jun is frantically trying to reach Hani, piecing together the puzzle about Ran and reflecting on their past interactions, particularly about why Hani might have kept her distance after getting pregnant. He's overwhelmed, shouting in the street, drawing stares. As rain starts to pour, everyone but Jun seeks shelter, leaving him alone with his thoughts. Later, in Dong Jin's car, Hani's patching up the cut on his face from when her date decided to throw a punch. Dong Jin can't help but laugh about the whole mess, which kinda throws Hani for a loop. 
He's like, did not see that coming. First time getting socked since my army days. Hani starts apologizing because, well, it's kind of a weird situation, right? But Dong Jin flips it on her, saying he's the one who should be sorry. Then he gets all serious and tells her his heart did this little skip when he saw her again. It's like all these feelings he thought were done and dusted came rushing back. And Hani? She's feeling all sorts of things because here's someone looking at her like she's more than just a mom or an ex, but her first love. It's exciting but also makes her feel guilty because of Ran. Dong Jin squinting, trying to figure out how he's gonna drive home half-blind, and Hani's like, do you even drive? Turns out, he needs a lift to the glasses store. Hani lets slip something about nothing house and then clamps her hand over her mouth, embarrassed. Dong Jin's quick to jump on that, teasing her about driving in the rain and hinting they should head to his place for some ramen, and yeah, we all know what that means. Hani's shocked, not expecting that from him. Cut to June, who's at the cafe freaking out because Hani's MIA. When she finally picks up his call, he's all, where are you, like it's some kind of emergency. Hani's worried, thinking something's up with Ran. Dong Jin's ready to play hero, offering to drive her wherever she needs to go. Just as Hani hits the gas, there's June, blocking their way like a scene from a movie. Hani steps into the rain, confronting June about Ran. He drops the bombshell, asking if Ran is his kid. That's a curveball for Hani. Meanwhile, Dong Jin's out there too, holding an umbrella over Hani like some knight in shining armor, totally clueless but trying to help. Hani brushes it off, telling Dong Jin to hang tight in the car. She's trying to dodge Jun's questions, insisting now's not the time or place. Jun's desperate for answers, but Hani's firm. They'll talk later. As they're about to leave, Jun's still shouting, wanting answers. Hani, though, she's done. She drives off, leaving Jun in the dust. On the way to fix Dong Jin's glasses, he's curious if Jun's her brother or something. Hani's not in the mood to chat, parking abruptly. Dong Jin, ever the joker, hands her his umbrella, making light of the situation. He then pitches the idea of a second date as an apology. Gives her this cheesy line to ask him out with. Hani can't help but ask if he's always this quirky. Dong Jin's like, why don't you date me and find out? Meanwhile, Jun's sitting in the rain all drenched, looking a mix of confused and scared. Just then, Hani steps in, umbrella in hand, suggesting they head back and have a proper chat. Jun's full of questions, wondering if Hani kept Ran a secret because he wasn't trustworthy, too young, or maybe because he's her friend's younger brother. He thinks she should've clued him in. Hani crouches down, explaining she didn't want to dump all this on him, wanting him to live his life freely. But Jun, he's not having it, smacks the umbrella out of her hand. He's like, how can you even say that? How can I just ignore all this when I'm Rant's dad and you're my dear friend? He's torn about what to do next, move away, never see them again? But then he takes a breath, calms down, and apologizes for kicking things off on such a rough note, pulling Hani into a hug. He's sorry she had to go through the pregnancy alone, thankful for Ran, and declares Ran as his one and only daughter. He's ready to jump into action, find a part-time job for child support. Hani pushes back, insisting he shouldn't feel pressured, reminding him of his excitement about his sabbatical. But jun has got a plan, suggests they live together. Hani's response? She freaks out and starts hitting him for even suggesting it. Jun tries to explain he just wants to make things work financially, but Hani's not easily convinced. She tells him straight, he's Ran's father, not a man to her. And Jun feels the same way. He pitches the idea of being a sort of live-in nanny, taking care of Ran, cooking, cleaning, all while contributing financially. Hani's tempted, not gonna lie. But she points out, this would mean the end of his precious sabbatical, betting he'd bail in a few days anyway. Jun argues he'll still have plenty of alone time when she's at work in Rans at daycare. He even promises to clear things up with Song Kyung. Hani wishes they could just keep pretending and avoid telling Song Kyung altogether. Jun's frustrated, how could they hide such a big thing? And what about Hani's parents? They love Jun like a son, but Hani's mortified at the thought of them finding out. She advises Jun to find a job he doesn't hate first then they'll figure out how to tell people. 
Feels to her like she's got another kid on her hands now. Heading home, June's asking about ramen. Hani's got some but tells him he's on his own for dinner. He tries to protest, but she's firm, she needs some space. Later, as June gets to work on that ramen, Hani's on the phone with Song Kyung, dodging questions about meeting June and keeping their encounter under wraps. Right after Hani wraps up her call, June's there, serving up the meal he's just cooked. He's practically bouncing on his toes, waiting for her verdict. She takes a bite, smiles, and tells him it's good. You can almost see the relief wash over him. But then, her phone buzzes. It's Dong Jean, checking in to see if she made it home okay. She texts back, letting him know she's safe and flips the conversation to ask about his glasses. As they're texting back and forth, June, who's been trying to play it cool, finally cracks and asks her who she's messaging so late into the night. He's wondering if it's the guy from earlier that day. Right on cue, Dong Jin's next message pops up, teasing about the umbrella incident. Just as Hani's about to reply, Jun makes a grab for her phone, reading the messages before she can stop him. Hani's not having it, yelling at Jun to hand it back, but Dong Jin keeps the texts coming, suggesting they bring Ran along on their next date to some kid-friendly spot he knows. The argument between Hani and Jun escalates quickly, with both of them raising their voices. Somehow, Hani manages to snatch her phone back and lands a playful hit on Jun's head, just as his own phone starts ringing. She's curious, asking if it's Song Kyung calling him, but when he says no, she probes further, wondering who's trying to reach him so desperately. Jun brushes it off, telling her not to worry about it and advises against giving Dong Jin her address. Meanwhile, Yen Peng is in her hotel room, dialing Jun's number over and over, but he's not picking up. She's come to terms with Ran being Jun's daughter, which, oddly enough, makes him more appealing to her. Yet, she can't shake the feeling that this revelation might push Jun further away from her, stirring up a mix of nerves and insecurity. She thinks about Hani and Song Kyung's friendship, pondering whether Song Kyung finding out about Jun and Ran might somehow work to her advantage. Cut to a lighter scene where Ran is dancing to some kids' music, with Deok Jin watching her and Song Kyung chatting away with Yenipeng on the phone. Yenipeng's invited Song Kyung out for a meal, and Song Kyung's all in. When she hangs up, Deok Jin's curious about the meetup, especially since Yenipeng's got her eyes on Jun. Song Kyung's all excited about Hani's blind date going well, which throws Deok Jin for a loop. Song Kyung's already dreaming about celebrating two big happy events this year, but Deok Jin's quick to throw a pillow her way, telling her to quit meddling. He questions how she could even think about setting Hani up on a date knowing full well Rans in the picture. Song Kyung fires back, frustrated at his lack of support, reminding him of the challenges Hani faces as a single mom. Deok Jin tries to point out that Jun's just next door if Hani ever needs help, but Song Kyung's not buying it, questioning if Jun's supposed to be Hani's personal bodyguard. Their argument heats up, with Ran quietly observing the whole scene. Song Kyung vents about Jun moving next door and the odd rumors swirling around Ran's daycare. She's convinced she needs to find both Hani and Jun's suitable partners, despite Deok Jin's pleas to stay out of it. Song Kyung insists on taking care of Jun, reminding Deok Jin of his promise to look after him until he's married. The conversation ends with Deok Jin walking out, leaving Song Kyung to reflect on her promise to her late father and her commitment to her husband once Jun is settled. Amidst the tension, Ran tugs at her shirt, expressing her dislike for the fighting. Song Kyung promises Ran, with a hug, that she'll try to keep the peace. The next day turns out to be one of those where everything runs late. Hani rushes to Rant's daycare, only to find out that Jun's already picked her up. The teacher tries to explain the situation, mentioning she couldn't get a hold of Hani and even though she initially refused Jun, Rant's insistence on leaving with her dad tipped the scales. Hani's a bit taken aback but makes it clear that she should be the first point of contact next time. Then, in a surprising turn, the teacher brings up her brother's behavior during the blind date, revealing her bewilderment at his aversion to single mothers given his own status as a divorcee. Hani's surprised by this new info but decides to keep the high road, simply wishing the teacher's brother finds happiness. Back at Hani's place, Jun and Ran are having a mini mirror moment with their juice boxes. Ran's bubbling with energy, eager to play, but leaves the how up to Jun. He suggests reading a book, and she's all for it. While searching for a book, Jun stumbles upon an album titled Rant's Growth Album, and curiosity gets the better of him. 
With Rand comfortably seated on his lap, they dive into the album together, flipping through pages filled with moments he's missed from ultrasound images to Rand's first steps. It's an emotional roller coaster for June, culminating in tears when he spots the photo from Rand's first birthday. He's moved, asking Rand if she'd like to add a new photo with him to the collection, and of course, she says yes. Meanwhile, Hani's been trying to reach June, puzzled by his silence. When she finally arrives home, the sight that greets her explains everything. June and Ran, asleep together on the couch, are a picture of peace. As she tiptoes closer, she accidentally nudges the album with her foot. Picking it up, she quickly browses through it, then settles down to watch them sleep. Observing them so closely, Hani can't help but notice the striking resemblance between father and daughter, a thought that leads her down a path of what-ifs about revealing her pregnancy earlier. Despite her initial reservations, seeing them together now fills her with a warmth she hadn't anticipated. She dozes off, comforted by the thought of relying on June more than she expected. Hours later, June wakes to find Hani asleep on the table. Carefully, he moves Rand to ensure she continues sleeping comfortably, then turns his attention to Hani. Watching her sleep sparks a series of imagined scenarios in his mind, from the mundane moments of daily life as a family to more intimate, dreamy sequences. Just as he's lost in his daydreams, Hani wakes up, catching him off guard. Her immediate shushing, mirroring his imagination, sends him into an even deeper blush. He's all set to leave, and even though Hani offers him to grab a bite before he goes, he's not having any of it and makes a beeline for the door. But then, he pauses, turns around, and drops the news that he's planning to put his place up for rent next week. Hani's puzzled, asking if that's really necessary. He gets all serious for a moment and says it's because he genuinely loves Ran. He dreams of buying her cute outfits, playing with her, and treating her to delicious meals. He wants to give her everything he missed out on, but he's out of a job. After he heads out, Hani's left talking to herself, musing about how Ran seems pretty taken with June. Just then, her phone lights up with a message from Dong Jean, wondering if the reason she hasn't given him her address is her way of saying no. She quickly shoots back a message, agreeing to meet him at the restaurant instead. After a bit of back and forth, Dong Jean throws out the idea of ditching the restaurant for Hongdae, known for its vibrant nightlife. It's been a hot minute since Hani last visited Hongdae, especially after hearing about Dong Jin's marriage and his band days coming to an end. She ends up turning down the Hongdae plan, not wanting to stay out late because of Ran, so they settle on a restaurant in Hongdae for 2 p.m. the next day. Hani can't help but feel that diving back into things with Dong Jin might be too much for her plate right now. So, she decides she'll have to let him down gently, pondering over how she's going to break the news as she sits next to a sleeping Ran, who accidentally kicks her mid-sleep. The next morning, she's knocking on Jun's door, asking if he can watch Ran while she steps out. Jun's quick to connect the dots to Dong Jean, questioning whether she's reigniting an old flame or if they're already an item. Hani keeps it vague, telling him she'll do what she needs to do and asks if he's up for watching Ran or if she should bring her along. Jun's response is to tag along. Their debate is cut short when Ran dashes toward the elevator, right as Yenipang steps out. Yenipang, all smiles, scoops up Ran, calling her adorable, then turns her attention to June, clearly puzzled by her unannounced visit. Hani, sensing the tension, suggests she'll take Ran to give June and Yenipang some space. Yenipang, catching wind of Hani's plans, expresses her interest in tagging along to Hongdae. She then volunteers to stay back with Ran and June, imagining it as a chance to grow closer to Ran. Ran seems on board with the idea, and Hani exits with a wave, leaving June in a mix of frustration and confusion. Yenipang, still keen on the Hongdae idea, convinces June and an excited Ran to head out. Fast forward to Hongdae, and June's navigating through the crowds, exhausted, with a sleeping Ran in his arms, thinking he's on his last leg, while Yenipang follows behind. She offers to take Ran, but June's not having it and suggests a pit stop at KFC, which doesn't exactly thrill Yenipang. Meanwhile, Hani and Dong Jin are catching up over dinner at a restaurant in Hongdae, reminiscing about how much the place has changed, except for those iconic Boss Spicy Rice Cakes. Dong Jin mentions he's moved nearby and proposes they grab dessert there, despite the feast they've just had. He even offers to drop her off after, ensuring they can enjoy their dessert on the go. Hani's trying to get a word in edgewise, planning to lay things out straight with Dong Jin, but he's already on a different page, wondering about his umbrella she borrowed. Turns out, 
She left it behind during her spat with Jun. Before she can steer the conversation back, Dong Jin's all excited about catching a show by his old bandmates post-dinner. Hani can't help but ask if his ex would be around, learning she's long gone to Busan to continue her acting career. That leads them down a more serious path, with Dong Jin sharing the tough times of their miscarriage and how he unfairly blamed her back then. He admits feeling low about how things went down but looks at Hani with admiration, praising her strength and warmth as a mother. He's so taken by her resilience that he pitches the idea of giving things another go, suggesting they meet three times before making any decisions. Hani, caught between her past affections for Dong Jin and her current reality, agrees more out of respect for what they once had, wanting to end things on a positive note. Meanwhile, Jun's in Hongdae, lugging a sleeping ran on his back while Yenipeng shops up a storm. He's mentally comparing the ordeal to his army days, questioning his sanity for bringing a kid along to such a bustling place. When he finally nudges Yenipeng to wrap it up for some food, she's all in for trying Hongdi's famed spicy rice cakes she spotted on Facebook. Post-dinner, Hani and Dong Jin are on the move again, with Dong Jin keen on seeing more of Ran through pictures. Just as Hani shares a snapshot, they bump into Jun, Yenipeng, and a still snoozing Ran. The surprise encounter throws everyone off balance, especially Hani, who can't hide her frustration at Jun for bringing Ran to such a crowded spot. Dong Jin, unfazed, greets Ran and then turns his attention to Jun, recognizing him as Diok Jin's brother-in-law from his school days. The introduction is awkward, thanks to Ran being in Jun's arms, leading to a light-hearted moment as Dong Jin attempts a handshake. Yenipeng urges Hani to continue her date, assuring her of Ran's safety with them. But before any plans can solidify, the skies open up, prompting a quick shuffle as Dong Jin takes Ran, suggesting they head to his car. Just as they're about to split ways, Jun interrupts, his protective side flaring up. He confronts Dong Jin, insisting they head home together, leaving no room for argument as he steps up, practically nose to nose with him. In the midst of all this, Hani points out that Jun's actually on a date with Yenipeng, who chimes in, saying she's starving and asking if they're still on for those spicy rice cakes. Jun suggests grabbing them to go and tells Dong Jin to hold up a sack. Dong Jin's like, hey, we might not all be heading in the same direction, but Jun's quick to mention he lives right next door to Hani. Fast forward to them in the car, and it's super quiet, kinda awkward, until Dong Jin breaks the ice by asking Jun his age. Hani jumps in, saying Jun's four years younger than her. Then Dong Jin's curious about what Jun does for a living, and Hani, trying to dodge the question, suggests playing some music instead. Jun's sitting there, stewing, wondering if Dong Jin's bringing this up because he knows Jun's out of a job. The music choice? An oldie about folks stuck in an elevator. Jun can't help but tell Dong Jin his music taste is ancient, but Dong Jin just laughs it off, saying he loves songs he can sing along to. Yenipane leans into Jun, suggesting the songs like their own story, which totally catches Hani off guard. Jun's confused, asking Yenipeng what she means, and she brings up their own elevator mishap, hinting she might use this to edge out Hani. Jun clarifies it was just an accident and asks Dong Jin to kill the music, with Hani echoing the request. With the tunes off, Dong Jin wonders aloud if Jun and Yenipeng have been an item for a while, noting they seem to match well. Jun's quick to correct him, saying it's not like that, while Yenipeng reminisces about their past dates and then compliments Dong Jin and Hani as a good pair, making Dong Jin smile and thank her. Dong Jin then throws a curveball, asking Jun how he'd feel about Dong Jin dating Hani. Jun's all, why does my opinion matter? If you like someone, that's all you need. Dong Jin nods, agreeing, and looks at Hani, saying as long as one person's into the other, it's cool. Jun then teases Dong Jin, saying he's gotta step up his game because Hani's not one to play hard to get, she's pretty chill around him. He starts spilling about how Hani used to act around her crushes, but Hani cuts him off, not wanting to relive her embarrassing moments, especially not the time she almost got too drunk over Dong Jin. Yenipeng whispers to Jun to zip it, and he whispers back, puzzled about what he did wrong. Right then, Ran wakes up, announcing she needs to pee, which leads to a mini-crisis since they're in the car with no bathroom in sight. Hani's asking Jun if he brought a diaper, and he's clueless, while Ran's getting more upset by the second. Hani's looking for a plastic bag, Dong Jin's got none, and just as Ran can't hold it any longer, Jun grabs Yenipeng's bag of spicy rice cakes for an emergency solution. By the time they reach the apartment, Ran's had an accident, and Yenipeng's spicy rice cakes didn't survive the ordeal. 
Han is apologizing to Dong Jin, offering to clean his car, but he's chill about it. Ran, upset, admits to Jun she wet herself and calls him dad, leaving Dong Jin pretty shocked. Jun's all business, saying he's off to change Ran, while Yenipang says bye to Dong Jin. Before Dong Jin leaves, he starts to ask Hani if Jun's really Ran's dad but decides against it last minute, just telling her to head up too. She gives him a smile, tells him to drive safe, and thinks she'll fill him in later. Back at Jun's place, Yenipang's waiting while Jun takes care of Ran. She's just sitting there, thinking how tough kid care is, feeling a mix of hunger and frustration over how the day went down. It wasn't even a proper date, and here she is, dealing with all this. And through it all, Jun was just focused on Ran. So, Hani waltzes into the apartment and is immediately on the lookout for Jun Yenipang, who's right there, points her in the right direction but not without throwing a curious glance about them sharing passcodes. Hani, trying to switch gears, casually drops that it's actually Jun's birthday today. Talk about timing, right? Just then, Q Jun and Ran making their grand entrance from the bathroom. Hani's all like, time to hit the road, kiddo, but Ran's having none of it. She plants herself right at Jun's feet, declaring she's teen dad tonight. Hani, not in the mood for negotiations, raises her voice a notch, and Ran scampers over to her side pronto. Jun, sensing some icy vibes, asks if he's the reason Hani's got that cloud over her head. Hani, keeping it short, says they'll chat later, throws a quick by Yenipang's way, and bam, the door slams shut behind them. Left to the awkward aftermath, Yenipang quizzes Jun if the Hong Day trip is what got Hani all ruffled. Jun, ever the peacemaker, offers up some ramen magic, only to find his pantry ramen less. He's all set to dial up some delivery when Yenipang insists she wants the homemade special. Jun's solution? Let's borrow some from Hani. Yenipang's response? A flat-out nope, claiming she'd rather starve than cross that doorway again. Jun, puzzled by the sudden tension, probes a bit deeper, asking Yenipang point-blank if there's something more between him and Hani. Yenipang, not one to mince words, lays it out, she knows Rance's his kiddo and wonders why he's still orbiting Hani if there's no spark there. Jun's taken aback, asking how she pieced that together. Yenipang's all, how could I not, pointing out Hani's dating scene as a clear sign she's not seeing Jun as anything more than, well, Jun. Diving deeper, Yenipang suggests maybe it's time Jun considered supporting Hani and ran from a distance, maybe even tagging along with her to China. Then she hits him with the million dollar question, is tying the knot with Hani on his mind, with her stepping into the mom role for Ran? She's all in, promising she'd be ace at it. Jun, caught in the headlights, begs her to drop the subject. Yenipang, hard on her sleeve, confesses she dropped everything for this, scared to lose him again. Jun tries to smooth things over, saying he hasn't been ignoring her, just tangled up in his own feelings. Yenipang's ready to help him sort through the mess, but Jun's firm on one thing, rants his priority, and he can't just sideline Hani. When Yenipang presses if he's got feelings for Hani, Jun admits she's family, but love? That's a puzzle he can't solve yet. Yenipang decides it's time to retreat, planning on hitting up her hotel's room service. As she heads out, she leaves Jun with a reminder of her never give up attitude, leaving Jun floored and alone. The next day, Songkyung and Yenipang are breaking bread at Yenipang's hotel, trading stories about their backgrounds. Yenipang shares about her globe-trotting parents, currently chilling in Hong Kong, and draws parallels to her own journey chasing after Jun Songkyung, playing the role of Jun's unofficial guardian angel dreams of him finding happiness with someone as vibrant as Yenipang, envisioning a future filled with laughter and little ones. But Yenipang catches a snag, Songkyung's unaware of Jun's surgery and his potential hesitations about expanding his family. Despite this, Songkyung is convinced of Jun's desire for more kids, given his adoration for Ran. Songkyung then asks Yenipang if she's the one who doesn't want kids, but Yenipang clears the air real quick, saying it's not about her not wanting kids. She's actually worried Jun might have some issues in that department. That's when Songkyung drops a bombshell, she herself can't have kids. She's been down that road, tried for ages, but eventually had to accept it wasn't happening for her. That's why she's got this big hope pinned on Jun, wanting him to be the dad she never could be, kinda to fulfill a promise she made to her late father. Yenipang's caught in a bit of a spot, thinking maybe it's not the best time to drop the Ran bombshell on Songkyung. But she's also feeling the clock ticking on making Jun see her in a different light, especially with Hani and Dong Jin potentially hitting it off. 
She let slip to Songkyung that she spotted Hani out with her date, and they seemed pretty cozy. Songkyung's intrigued but mentions she heard through the grapevine that the date was a bit of a flop. Yenipeng adds that the guy, Dong Jin, is actually an old buddy of Deokjin's, which kinda takes Songkyung by surprise. That evening, while Yenipeng's wrestling with getting Ran to eat something, Jun comes barging in, hauling a heavy box, dropping the news he's planning on moving his stuff out bit by bit. Then Yenipeng hits him with another curveball, Ran's running a fever and being super stubborn about eating. Jun steps up, promising he'll handle the feeding. Ran, though, isn't having any of it and instead pleads for a piggyback ride. Out of nowhere, Hani gets buzzed by Song Kyung, who's straight up asking why Hani didn't mention bumping into Dong Jin. Hani's caught off guard, wondering how Song Kyung got wind of this, only to find out Yenipeng spilled the beans. Song Kyung's all questions, wondering if Dong Jin's single and if there's going to be a round two. Hani plays it cool, saying it was just a chance encounter over dinner. Song Kyung's advice? Hang on to Dong Jin. Their call gets cut short when Deok Jin makes his entrance. Meanwhile, Dong Jin's burning the midnight oil with his crew, who suggests switching up the scenery to a themed motel, specifically the jungle room. Dong Jin's hit with a flashback of meeting Hani there and remembers she was with Jun, which sends him scrambling out the door, promising to foot the bill for the room. Back at Hani's place, she and Jun finally manage to get Ran fed, medicated, and tucked into bed. Jun's complaining about his back being drenched from the earlier piggyback adventure. Hani gives him a once-over, then playfully smacks him on the back, urging him to shower. Suddenly, Jun's in pain, but not where you'd expect, he's feeling it somewhere a bit more personal. He tries to brush it off as back pain, but inside, he's all kinds of flustered by Hani's touch. Then, Dong Jin calls, and before Hani can even respond, Jun snatched the phone, telling Dong Jin ran sick and they're in for a long night, then hangs up. Hani's fuming, accusing Jun of sending the wrong signals to Dong Jin. Jun flips the script, asking what's there to misunderstand, then goes in for a kiss. After the kiss, Hani's blushing like crazy. Jun lets her know that he doesn't want her seeing Dong Jin because he's Rant's dad. Hani's quick to remind him that's all he is to her, Rant's dad, not a man, but Jun's not having it. He tells her it's time to see him as a man and suggests they start dating. Hani's taken aback, questioning if she's even his type. When he says yes, she challenges him, pushing him against the wall, ready to show him what a real kiss is like. Jun goes red in the face, asking her to hang on a sec. She can't help but call him out, you're such an idiot, telling him to cut the act. She's about to say more, but he quiets her with a kiss, first on the forehead, then the cheek, and finally, her lips, catching her so off guard she hiccups. He wishes her a good night, leaving her standing there, cheeks on fire. As he steps outside, he's practically shaking from the pain, thinking if he had hung around any longer, he would have hit the deck. Meanwhile, Dong Jin's in his car, mulling over that call from Jun. He's piecing things together, wondering if there's more to Hani and Jun than meets the eye, especially with Yenipeng thrown into the mix. He decides to get the lowdown himself and dials Hani. She's staring at the ringing phone, then over at Ran, out like a light but sick as a dog. The thought crosses her mind to invite Dong Jin in, but then those kisses from Jun flash through her head, and she's shaking it like a Polaroid picture. The phone buzzes again, and this time she answers, catching Dong Jin off guard. She explains she can't step out, what with Ran being sick and Jun already back at his place. She's all apologies, urging him to just spill what's on his mind. But Dong Jin's like, not over the phone, and tries for a rain check at a concert by his old bandmates. She's not biting, though, weeknights are a no-go. They settle on maybe catching up over the weekend, and she hangs up, leaving Dong Jin staring at the moon, all revved up about giving love another shot, promising himself he won't let it slip away this time. Cut to Yenipeng, putting herself together while chatting up her contact in China. He's telling her to pack it up and come back, but she's having none of it, reminding him she didn't ask for a timeout but handed in her walking papers. He tries to remind her of her drive, the same one that got him to the top, wondering aloud if that's why she's going all in on June. She cuts the conversation short, sets on her path with June, and ends the call. Right then, room service knocks, bringing in food and wine. She's got plans, asking the guy if he can doll up the room with flowers and candles, aiming for a vibe that screams proposal. He's curious about the occasion, 
but she lays it out, she's setting the stage for something big. Meanwhile, Jun's battling his own demons with a push-up marathon, trying to work through whatever's got him all twisted up inside. The moment he stops feeling like he's been run over, he calls it quits. But then, memories of Hanmi flood back, and he's back on the floor, pushing up until Yenipang's call breaks the cycle. She sounds like she's about to jump out of her skin, telling him to race over to the hotel, stat. He's up and into his clothes in a flash, worried sick about her. Over at the hotel, Yenipang's laying her cards on the table, ready to go all in tonight if she gets the chance. As Hani sits there, her mind wanders back to a time when she and June were just high school seniors. She remembers how June, in the throes of teenage rebellion, would often find solace in sneaking into her room after his all-too-frequent spats with his dad. There's this one night that sticks out in her memory, she was hitting the books hard when she caught the familiar signal from June opening her window, she saw him, battered and bruised. Helping him inside, she could see the toll his father's actions had taken on him that night. When she asked if his dad had been drinking again, Jun only wanted to know if Song Kyung was around, mistakenly thinking she might be at the reading room. Hani knew better, Song Kyung was working her shift at the convenience store, but she didn't have the heart to tell Jun that. Instead, she promised to text Song Kyung and offered to whip up some ramen for Jun, whose stomach was audibly protesting by then. But as she made her way to the kitchen, she stumbled upon a heartbreaking conversation between her parents about divorce. They believed staying together for her sake was the only option, a revelation that cut Hani deeply. She was ready to confront them head-on, but Jun held her back. Back in the safety of her room, they sat in silence until Jun mused about the complexities of adult relationships. Feeling betrayed by her parents' facade of happiness, Hani declared her refusal to follow in their footsteps, hinting at a drastic decision against moving to Seoul or even continuing her life. Jun, in his gentle way, tried to steer her away from confrontation, not out of allegiance to her parents, but from a place of understanding and envy for what she had, despite everything. His own longing for a mother's love and a life free from his father's harshness was palpable. That night, choosing ramen and each other's company over despair, they made silent vows, Hani, to never marry if it meant living like her parents, and Jun, to be the father he never had. Now, with those memories fresh in her mind, Hani can't help but wonder about their future happiness. The road ahead seems cluttered with hurdles, Song Kyung's unspoken expectations and Yenipang's sudden presence. She ponders if maybe Jun would find happiness with Yenipang instead. Upon arriving at the hotel, Jun is met with an urgent Yenipang who swiftly ushers him into her room, adorned for what appears to be a celebration. Confused, Jun questions if it's her birthday, only to learn it's an occasion far more significant. After sharing a toast, Yenipang takes a bold step, kneeling before him, and asks him to marry her, vowing to make him happy. Jun gets up to leave, but Yenipang isn't having it. She yells at him not to run away like a coward, before wrapping him in a hug from behind and begging him to spend the night with her. Jun reminds her about his condition, but she presses on, asking if he would still avoid her if it wasn't for the pain. If that's the case, she'll let him go, assuring him he won't feel a thing tonight. Suddenly, Jun crumples to the floor, groaning in agony. He manages to say between pained breaths that he's leaving as he crawls toward the door. Yenipang accuses him of lying, revealing she mixed painkillers in with the wine. This revelation shocks Jun, who was only pretending to be hurting. She demands to know if she's really not worthy of him. Jun sheepishly apologizes and confesses he's been thinking of sending her back to China. Yenipang explodes, asking if she ever wanted to go back. She reminds him how she waited patiently while he was hung up on Ran, and insists she can help with his fatherly duties and be a mother to Ran. She demands to know if he loves her or Hani. Rising to his feet, Jun declares that Hani is the one he needs to look after. Yenipang questions if that's what Hani even wants and why he's putting in so much effort. Jun snaps back angrily, frustrated that everyone is telling him not to try when that's all he knows how to do. He passionately expresses his desire to stay by Hani's side and protect her forever, emphasizing that she's been like family to him since childhood. He asserts there's nothing wrong with wanting to be with the people most important to him. Yenipang realizes Jun is a fool blinded by love. With tears streaming down her face, she asks if she doesn't matter to him after all their time together. 
June assures her she is precious in his eyes. He reminds her how amazing she looked when he first saw her and affirms that she shines brightest in her element, adored by everyone. That's where she belongs, not by his side. Yenipeng declares that she shines because she always gives her all, no matter how low she sinks. She believes if she goes back now, her life is over. So she resolves to try one last time. Yenipeng calls room service to order more alcohol, then proposes a bet. Jun refuses, getting up to go. She threatens to reveal to Seeing Kyung that he's Rant's dad if he leaves. Sitting back down reluctantly, Jun chides her behavior, saying it isn't like her. Yenipeng insists she means what she says. She explains the drinking game first to pass out loses and has to grant the winner one wish. Jun confirms that if he wins, she'll go back to China. She agrees, so they clink glasses and start downing drinks. Many bottles later, both are completely sloshed. Jun slurs that it's her turn. Yenipeng just moans, unmoving. Jun proclaims his victory and staggers to the door before collapsing in the doorway. Yenipeng stands up groggily, insisting it's not over. Seeing Jun out cold, she gets the drunken idea to seduce him. But the room spins and she topples over on top of him. The hotel worker who helped set up Yenipeng's proposal decorations discovers them in a heap. Jun's phone rings and the worker answers, informing a concerned Hani that the owner is passed out drunk at the hotel. Jun wakes up with a pounding headache, only to be shocked by the sight of Yenipeng sleeping beside him. He bolts out of bed, frantically checking if he's still fully clothed. After covering her with a blanket, Jun softly apologizes, expressing his hope that she'll find someone who will care for her more than he ever could. He wishes for her happiness before making his exit. Yenipeng, now sitting up, realizes she has failed and ponders whether to return to China, questioning if this marks the end of her relationship with Jun. Later, as Jun rides the elevator in his apartment building, he's stunned to discover it's already past 2 p.m. The doors open on the seventh floor, revealing a dressed-up Hani, much to his surprise. He inquires about her work and Rant's whereabouts, but she ignores his questions, instead asking if he's getting off the elevator. Caught off guard, Jun fibs about heading to the convenience store. As they descend, he probes further, asking if something's wrong, where she's going, and if he should pick up Ran from daycare. Hani assures him that Seeing Kyung will handle Ran's pickup, so he needn't worry. An awkward silence ensues until Jun asks if she's upset with him, possibly due to the kiss. Hani tells him to take his apartment off the market, emphasizing that living together is too much for her, no matter how many times she mulls it over. Surprised by her sudden change of heart, especially after he's already packed his belongings, Jun seeks an explanation. Hani looks him in the eye and drops the bombshell, she knows he spent the previous night with Yenipeng at a hotel. Jun insists it was all a misunderstanding and pleads with Hani to trust him, but she retorts by questioning if they're playing a game of trust. Undeterred, Jun trails her to the bus station and even sits behind her on the bus, despite her cold shoulder. As he ponders how she discovered his night with Yenipeng, he can't help but find her scariness when angry. After a while, he leans in and whispers, pointing out that they're not heading towards her workplace and asking where she's going. Just then, the driver announces Hongdae as the next stop, leaving Jun stunned. As they arrive in Hongdae, Jun spots Dong Jin already waiting for Hani. She exits the bus with Jun hot on her heels, exchanging pleasantries with Dong Jin, who begins to inquire about Jun's presence. Hani brushes it off, telling him not to worry. Jun feels a sharp pain in his chest, wondering if it's from drinking too much the night before or something else entirely. At the club, Dong Jin questions Hani about Jun, who's trying to remain hidden. Apologizing to Dong Jin, Hani asks him to wait while she has a word with Jun. Approaching Jun with visible irritation, Hani tells him he's really getting on her nerves. Jun maintains that the previous night was a misunderstanding and that he went to the hotel to end things with Yenipeng. Hani, having none of it, tells him to go home and stop bothering her. 
June, however, stands his ground, declaring he'll wait right there. He challenges her, saying if she doesn't think of him while inside the club with Dong Jin, he won't bother her anymore and will simply be Rant's father. Before Hani can respond, Dong Jin informs her that the concert is about to begin. She turns away from June and enters the club, with Dong Jin draping his arm around her, much to June's dismay. Clutching his chest once more, June ponders his next move, considering that in his mind, he and Hani have already started dating. The rain begins to pour heavily, but June remains rooted to the spot. Inside the club, Hani and Dong Jin revel in the music performed by Dong Jin's former bandmates. Curious about the vocalist, Hani learns from Dong Jin that he's a guest member, as the band has been cycling through different vocalists and now opts for collaborations instead. As the music fades, Sung Hoon takes the stage, announcing that their next song is a tribute to a visiting friend. A spotlight illuminates Hani and Dong Jin, and Hani waves as the crowd applauds. Sung Hoon then reveals that they've invited a female guest vocalist for the upcoming song, but as she's not quite ready, he encourages the audience to take a bathroom break. Dong Jin expresses his hope for a ballad, which Hani agrees would be fantastic. Just then, Hani overhears someone mentioning the heavy rainfall outside, prompting Dong Jin to ask if June has left. Hani assures him that June must have gone by now. Dong Jin then brings up the fact that despite meeting three times, Hani still hasn't returned his umbrella. He confesses that he had been thinking if she returned it between their encounters, it would have signaled the end of their connection. Dong Jin also admits he had something he wanted to ask her, but not anymore. He acknowledges that he acts as if he hasn't seen anything or met her before, even though he already knows her. Gently taking her hand, he explains that he wanted to see her even if pretending was the only way because life is unpredictable. Hani, recognizing Dong Jin's kindness, realizes she can't hurt him, but also can't stop thinking about Jun apologizing, she withdraws her hand from his. As she turns to leave, Dong Jin pulls her back, requesting they stay for the next song, allowing him to create at least one complete memory with her. The slow, pulsating vibrations from the guitar strings resonate with her heartbeat, like the falling raindrops, and in that moment, Hani understands that Jun is the only one who truly matters to her. Hani tells Dong Jin she has something important to share with him and hopes he'll listen after the concert. Hani tells Dong Jin she has something important to share with him and hopes he'll listen after the concert. As the female vocalist takes the stage, she reveals her reason for coming to see a dear old friend and sing the song she used to sing while thinking of him on rainy days. As the singer's voice fills the room, Hani is struck by its familiarity. After a moment, she exclaims he Ju, which happens to be the name of Dong Jin's ex-wife. Shocked, Dong Jin insists they leave immediately, brushing off Hani's attempt to discuss He Ju further. Stepping outside the club, Dong Jin spots Jun shivering in the rain. He approaches him, questioning why he's standing there and advising him not to keep pushing when someone says no. Jun tells him not to worry about it, but Dong Jin continues, saying that liking someone means always being there for them when they need it most. He accuses Jun of being a coward and venting at the wrong person. Jun, however, declares that from now on, he'll do everything Dong Jin mentioned and more everything he hasn't been able to do for Hani. Dong Jin warns him not to make promises he can't keep, even if Ran weren't in the picture. Hani, surprised, asks Dong Jin if he knew Ran was Jun's daughter. Jun proudly confirms that Ran is his one and only daughter, with no reason to deny it. Dong Jin shares a story about a guy who convinced the girl he impregnated to marry him, only for a miscarriage to occur, leaving no sense of responsibility between them. He doesn't want Hani to face the same fate. When Jun asks what he's implying, Dong Jin explains that Hani is torn because of him, so even if she makes Jun wait forever, he can't give up because he must always be there for her. Turning to Hani, Dong Jin apologizes, saying he can't take her home due to lacking a car or umbrella, and then walks away. Jun smiles at Hani, who questions why he didn't listen when she told him to go home. He takes her hands, 
confessing his worries about what would happen if she didn't return, if he shouldn't have said the things he did, and how difficult it was seeing her with Dong Jin, causing his heart to ache. He proposes they date properly this time. Hani likens him to an elementary school kid nagging for things, but Jun pulls her into a hug, vowing to stay by her side despite her struggles. He promises to wait even if she pushes him away, expressing his feelings for her. Hani stops resisting, and they remain embracing in the rain. Meanwhile, Dong Jin smokes in a corner, recalling the day he met Hani at the motel and carried Jun into the room. His thoughts drift to his ex-wife, realizing he wasn't as over her as he thought, his mind going blank and emotions surging upon seeing her. He couldn't hold Hani back knowing Jun was waiting for her outside. Suddenly, he Ju appears, saying she thought he'd be there. Dong Jin thinks she always shows up at the most critical moments. He calls her a ghost, and she explains that he left without saying goodbye, so she followed him after the song. She brings up the incident with Jun at the club entrance, but he dismisses it as none of her business. Taking the cigarette from him, she comments that he doesn't even smoke and starts smoking herself. When he asks why she returned, she simply says she missed him. Dong Jin starts walking away, but he Ju stops him, offering her umbrella and mentioning she brought her car. He brushes her off, and she playfully comments on his lack of fun while putting out the cigarette on the bottom of her shoe and pocketing it. Dong Jin reminds her not to do that, but she counters that there's no waste bin and she's a good citizen, despite being a bad girl. Then, she kisses him. When she pulls away, Dong Jin wipes his mouth, and she asks if she was the only one pining. After glaring at her briefly, they start kissing passionately. Dong Jin mentally berates himself for starting smoking again after just quitting, finding the smoky smell from both of them irritating. He reflects on how they knew smoking was bad but kept doing it like addicts, wishing he hadn't picked up the habit again. Meanwhile, Jun holds Hani's hand on the bus ride home, blushing. When she tries to pull away, he grips tighter, causing her to blush too. They hold hands the entire way, and Jun discovers the range of emotions that can be conveyed through this simple act. At Hani's apartment, Jun reluctantly lets go, and Hani tells him to go home. He contemplates going inside with her, while Hani senses his desire to do so. Internally, he repeats that he doesn't want to leave, but she tells him to shower before he catches a cold. Jun calls her name as if to say something but loses his nerve and walks away like a sad puppy. Hani calls after him, exciting him as he thinks she's about to invite him in, but she simply tells him to sleep warmly and shuts the door. Inside, Hani wonders why she behaves the way she does, blushing. At Jun's place, he showers, thinking about his desire to be with Hani and the pain he'll experience if he gets too close. Holding hands is okay, but he can't kiss her. Meanwhile, Hani brushes her teeth, wondering if Jun will return. Lying on his bed, Jun ponders Hani finding out about his injury, wishing he had gone for a checkup instead of hoping the pain would fade with time. He rolls around, longing to be with Hani. Later, Hani makes coffee, wondering if Jun is asleep due to the lack of noise from his apartment. Suddenly, she hears Jun opening her door, shocking her. She hopes he won't come in, and when all goes quiet, she wonders if he left. Out of nowhere, Jun speaks from behind her, expressing his desire to be with her. She offers him coffee, but he declines, asking to hold her for a moment as he embraces her from behind. Hani's heart pounds so loudly that Jun can hear it. Just as she starts thinking about lambs to calm herself, Jun's stomach lets out a huge growl, totally embarrassing him. Hani asks if he's hungry, but he insists he wants her more than food. He hugs her tightly, only for his stomach to rumble again, sending them both into a fit of hysterical laughter. As their giggles subside, Hani offers to make him ramen before he leaves. Jun playfully accuses her of starving him all day, then thinks to himself that they might have officially started dating. That weekend, Jun finally moves into Hani's apartment. She gives him the upstairs space, as she sleeps on a blanket downstairs with Ran. 
While they're organizing June's things, Ran starts climbing the stairs. June immediately scoops her up, warning her that it's dangerous. He promises that since they're all under one roof now, he'll come downstairs whenever she misses him. Ran adorably asks if he's really going to live with them every day, and when he confirms, she muses how nice it would be if Seeing Kyung and Deok Jin lived with them too. Jun tells Ran that she mustn't tell anyone he's living there, especially not Seeing Kyung. When she asks why, he explains that other people can't know about their living arrangement. He holds out his pinky, asking her to promise. She links her tiny finger with his, sealing the deal. Hani, who's been observing their interaction, worries about what would happen if Seeing Kim drops by unexpectedly and considers changing her password. Meanwhile, at Seeing Kim's place, she's on the phone with Hani's mother, trying to refuse the money Hani's mom sent behind Hani's back because it makes her uncomfortable. Hani's mom clarifies that the money is actually from Hani's father, surprising Seeing Kim. She asks if Hani's mom is in frequent contact with him. Hani's mom reveals that it's because Seeing Kim keeps sending pictures of Ran, and Hani's father visits to see them since he doesn't have a smartphone. Seeing Kim laughs, speculating that Hani's father isn't upgrading his phone on purpose. She suggests they get back together, thinking Hani would like that. Hani's mom dismisses the idea and instructs Seeing Kim to use the money to buy Ran clothes and good food. She cautions Seeing Kim not to tell Hani about the money which Seeing Kyung agrees to. Seeing Kyung mentions calling Hani and Jun over for a barbecue since it's been a while. Hani's mom expresses her trust in Seeing Kyung, which is why she allowed Hani to live with her, noting that Hani always refused to stay with her own mother. She thanks Seeing Kyung for everything, but Seeing Kyung insists that what she's done is nothing compared to what Hani's mom did for her and Jun growing up. After hanging up, Seeing Kyung considers inviting Hani and Jun over for a healthy meal, then wonders about calling Yeni Pang too. Speaking of Yeni Pang, she's sitting alone in the hotel restaurant, drinking and contemplating whether to return to China. As she heads back to her room, she reflects on how there was no point competing for Jun's love once Ran entered the picture. She wishes someone would teach her how to let go of her feelings. Just as she reaches her room, her boss calls. She immediately answers, telling him she's thinking of coming back. He threatens to fire her if she doesn't return by next week, accusing her of failing to be professional. She retorts that she wouldn't be with him even if she went back to China. Her boss demands to know what's so great about Jun and what he has besides his looks. Yeni Peng admits she likes Jun for his handsome face. Her boss scoffs, asking what's so handsome about Jun who he compares to Pale Tofu. As he begins describing what a real man should look like, Yeni Pang hangs up on him. She ponders why she likes Jun so much and if it's really just because of his appearance. She tells herself that can't be the reason, as she's not that shallow. Just as she's about to enter her room, the door next to hers bursts open, and a well-dressed, handsome man steps out and approaches her. He removes his sunglasses and asks for her help. Yeni Peng looks at him in surprise, thinking he resembles the Korean star Son Jun Ki. Someone calls out Appa from inside the man's room, and he quickly apologizes to Yeni Peng before following her into her room. Just as they enter, a girl wearing only a towel emerges from his room, calling for him. Inside Yeni Peng's room, they listen at the door until the coast seems clear. The man orders Yeni Peng to fetch him a glass of water, but she snaps back telling him to check the fridge himself. He asks if she remembers meeting him before, then takes her hand, declaring that they've traveled the world to find each other again. He proclaims that she's his destiny, kisses her hand, and insists he's her destiny too. Yeni Peng yanks her hand away, demanding to know what he's doing. Surprised, he asks if she's a foreigner, wondering how she could not recognize the famous line from the hit drama Lover of You Alone, starring him, Son Jun Ki, which had a whopping 30% viewership. She asks if he's really Son Jun Ki, and he assumes she must have seen him in the drama. Grabbing a water bottle and taking a swig, 
Junki explains that he's in a bit of a pickle and needs to lay low in her room for a bit before leaving. Yeni Peng expresses her doubts about his identity, noting that the real Son Jun Ki has thicker eyebrows, redder lips, and fairer skin. Irritated, Jun Ki insists it's all makeup and that he's currently au naturel. He gripes about months of shooting outdoors and overnight, yet his skin still manages to look flawless. As he makes himself at home, Yeni Peng, still skeptical, asks why he's there. Jun Ki reveals that the hotel is close to his filming location and asks if she has any snacks. She calls him out for speaking to her rudely, asserting that despite being Chinese, she knows the difference between honorifics and disrespect. He's surprised by her fluency in Korean and assumes she must be traveling, though he finds her too beautiful to be a mere traveler. She glares at him, and he offers her his autograph. She tells him to leave since his hidden lover seems to have vanished, but he clarifies that the girl was supposedly a fan who turned into a crazy stalker. Jun Ki calls someone, instructing them not to involve the police. Yeni Peng questions why he doesn't want the stalker arrested, mentioning that she's had a few stalkers herself, so she knows they shouldn't be left unchecked. Jun Ki explains that the stalker used to be his biggest fan when he first debuted, and despite his attempts to reason with her and even involving the cops, she persisted. He's grown accustomed to it and believes she'll eventually give up if he keeps running. Yeni Peng suggests the girl should stop now if she wants to leave Jun Ki with good memories. She reflects on how she, too, should quit while Jun still has positive memories of her. As Jun Ki heads for the door, he advises Yeni Peng not to feel down, so she'll miss Korea when she returns home. She's surprised he's leaving, and he reveals he's switching hotels. He thanks her and asks her name. When she tells him, he declares that if they meet again, it's destiny. After he's gone, Yeni Peng thinks he's a bit cheesy, but thanks to him, she was able to stop dwelling on Jun. She wishes she had taken pictures with Jun Ki to brag to her friends. Sitting in the chair he just vacated, she feels like meeting Son Jun Ki and her time with Jun were all a dream. She muses that once Jun Ki's scent fades, she'll wake up from the dream and go back. With that, she bids Jun farewell. Meanwhile, at Hani's place, Jun asks Ran what she wants to be when she grows up. She adorably replies that she wants to be him because he's strong, cool, and plays with her. Jun reflects on the importance of living well since Ran aspires to be like him. He tells her he hopes she doesn't become an adult like he was, stuck behind a desk and only seeing a square world until he was 20. He describes the life he wants for her, and by the time he finishes, Ran has fallen asleep. Hani emerges from the bathroom, asking if Ran is asleep. When Jun confirms, she tells him he can go shower. He turns to her, asking if he can sleep there with them. In that moment, he looks so sexy and irresistible to Hani that she blushes and shouts no. The following day, as Hani blow dries her hair, she asks Jun to tie Ran's hair. As Jun goes to do that, Ren suddenly yelps that her foot is stinging, catching him off guard. Hani explains that Ran has a cramp and tells Jun to massage it, which he does. Later, as Jun drives Hani and Ran, Hani mentions that Jun will be picking Ran up from daycare, which gets the little girl all excited and makes Hani a bit jealous. She reminds Jun about the lunch invitation from Song Kyung the next day since they had promised to visit often after moving out but haven't followed through. Jun agrees that they should definitely go for lunch to avoid having to throw a housewarming party. Meanwhile, at work, Deok Jin is enjoying his morning coffee by the window when he spots Jun's car pulling up. He watches in shock as Hani and Jun interact, wondering if they have started dating. Later that day, Yena Peng gets a call from Song Kyung just as she is parking her luggage. Song Kyung invites her to lunch, mentioning that Jun and Hani will be there too. Yena Peng initially hesitates, thinking it will be awkward for Jun, but then a mischievous idea pops into her head. She accepts the invitation, thinking it will be the perfect opportunity to prank Jun and make sure he remembers her forever before she leaves. It is the price he has to pay for dumping her. The next day, 
The lunch at Songkyung's is a bit awkward for everyone except Songkyung and Yenapang, who are laughing and joking around. Songkyung catches everyone off guard by asking Yenapang about her marriage plans and suggesting that it would be nice if her child was like Ran. Jun tries to shut down the conversation, but Yenapang keeps stirring the pot by asking Hani about her relationship with Dong Jin. Songkyung even suggests inviting Dong Jin over, much to Deok Jin's annoyance. Things get even more uncomfortable when Yenapang mentions that her first love was a father with a child, nearly giving Deok Jin a heart attack and making Hani angry. Songkyung, intrigued, says it must have been a dangerous first love, but Yenapang claims she had to give it up to avoid wasting her life. After the meal, Deok Jin and Jun go to another room to talk, while Yenapang asks Hani to do the same. Songkyung, left alone with Ran, wonders what kind of conversation requires closed doors. As she helps Ran untie her painful hairstyle, the little girl innocently reveals that her daddy, Jun, ties her hair every morning. Song Kyung is surprised and asks if Jun goes to their house every morning, curious about what is really going on between Jun and Hani. As Song Kyung tries to get more information from Ran about Jun being her daddy, the little girl suddenly remembers her promise to Jun. She quickly tells Song Kyung that she can't talk because she's sleepy and pretends to fall asleep on the floor. Despite Song Kyung's attempts to wake her, Ran just yawns and tells her not to talk to her. Song Kyung immediately suspects that something is up. In another room, Yenapang surprises Hani by revealing that she's going back to China. Hani apologizes, thinking Jun will be sad, but Yenapang turns the tables on her, saying she's sorry for pursuing Jun even though she knew he was Rant's father. Hani is shocked that Yenapang knew all along, but Yenapang admits she always had her eyes on Jun. They agree to be friends if they meet again someday. Before leaving, Yenapang decides to share a secret with Hani about Jun getting into a small accident in China and needing surgery. She warns Hani not to ask Jun about it directly, as it would hurt his pride, but suggests that Hani should help him fully heal by feeling every inch of his body to find the injured area. Hani blushes at the thought. Meanwhile, Deok Jun offers to train Jun in the publishing business, revealing that he knows Ran is Jun's child. Jun is surprised and apologizes for not telling him sooner. Deok Jun explains that he's been keeping an eye on Hani since she got pregnant and even let them live in his home while Jun was away. Jun thanks him and promises to tell Song Kyung about Ran during Chuseok. Deok Jun then surprises Jun by offering to leave his firm to him and Hani, explaining how the publishing world has changed due to mobile phones, e-publishing, and the Chinese market. He believes Jun is perfect for the job with his Chinese and computer skills, as well as his sales experience in China. Jun agrees to think about it. Back in the sitting room, Song Kyung covers a sleeping Ran with a blanket, determined to ask her more questions when she wakes up. She wonders how close Jun and Hani are, considering he visits every day. When Hani and Yenapang come out, Song Kyung asks Hani if Jun visits often. Hani panics, not knowing what to say, but Jun jumps in and claims he's been eating breakfast at Hani's place because making breakfast is bothersome, so he ties Rant's hair while freeloading. Song Kyung angrily scolds him for taking advantage of someone who's busy going to work with a child every morning. Jun defends himself, saying he takes Rant to daycare every day as compensation for the free breakfast. Song Kyung isn't entirely convinced that's all there is to the story. Suddenly, Yenapang suggests that she and Jun go on a date, as she has something to tell him. Jun starts to refuse, but Hani surprises him by encouraging him to go and even take Yenapang to her hotel afterwards. She offers to take Ran home, causing Songkyung to reconsider her suspicions about Jun and Hani's relationship. Songkyung then suggests that Ran stay with her for the night, promising to take her to daycare the next day. Deok Jin, sensing the growing tension, advises everyone to disperse before things get too hectic. As Jun drives Hani and Yenapang, Hani asks to be dropped off at the bus stop, but Jun insists on taking her home before leaving with Yenapang. Yenapang playfully asks Hani if she can keep Jun a little longer, promising not to steal him away. The two women laugh at the joke, 
but the mood shifts when Hani receives a call from Dong Jin. She tells him she'll meet up, prompting Jun to abruptly stop the car and question her intentions. Hani explains that she needs to have a final talk with Dong Jin, and Yenipang mumbles that farewells should be courteous. Reluctantly, Jun agrees to let Hani go. Once Hani leaves, Jun asks Yenipang where she wants to go, and she surprises him by saying China. He initially thinks it's a joke, but she reveals that she's leaving the next day. When she asks if he's sad, he admits he is, but she points out that he isn't trying to stop her. Jun asks her to cancel her flight and suggests they go together, but Yenipang declines, saying she needs to leave her feelings for him behind. As they share an emotional moment, Yenipang asks Jun to upgrade her flight to first class as compensation for not accompanying her, and he agrees. Meanwhile, at a cafe, Hani asks Dong Jin if he's back with Heeju. He reveals that Heeju has been visiting his house uninvited, acting uncharacteristically meek, which makes him feel sorry for her. Hani encourages him to give Heeju another chance and teasingly asks if he ever got jealous over her. Dong Jin admits that he did, because of Jun. He confesses his envy of Jun's childlike, unwavering love for Hani, remembering how Jun waited for her in the rain. Dong Jin wishes he could love someone like that. Hani shares that she thought she'd never have a romantic relationship and would waste her youth, but then Dong Jin came along, and now she likes Jun. As they shake hands, Dong Jin tells Hani that she must find happiness, and while he gave up on his love before it began, he won't yield in his next love. Hani thanks him, and they both think about finding happiness. At the airport the next day, Jun wheels Yenipang's luggage to the departure gate as she trails behind, lost in thought. She wonders if they'll ever cross paths again, realizing that Jun will no longer be a part of her life. Tears start to well up in her eyes, and Jun rushes back to her, concerned. Yenipang embraces him, confessing that she doesn't want to say goodbye. Jun reassures her that this won't be their last encounter and suggests staying in touch through Facebook or meeting up if she ever returns to Korea on a business trip. His words bring her some comfort. Yenipang playfully remarks that Jun's dull personality actually helps in moments like these, then tells him he can go. Jun reminds her not to cry and expresses his belief that she'll find someone so amazing that she'll forget all about him. They exchange thumbs up, agreeing wholeheartedly, and part ways. In their minds, they thank each other for everything and wish for the other's happiness. As Yenipang boards the plane and waits for the other passengers, she gazes out the window, sunglasses on, reflecting on how she thought June was her final love, but now she's returning to China alone. Tears stream down her face as she vows to find someone even better than June suddenly, someone taps her shoulder while she's blowing her nose, and she snaps at them. The person informs her that she's in his seat, and she apologizes, starting to move. However, he pulls her back, telling her to clean up the mess she made. As she goes to do so, she catches a familiar scent of his perfume. The person then yanks off her sunglasses, revealing himself to be Son Jun Ki. He asks if she recognizes him, and she grabs her sunglasses back, calling out the name of the drama he mentioned when they first met. He leans in and whispers the last thing he said to her about being each other's destiny, making her blush. With a smile, he says it's nice to see her again. Meanwhile, Jun, who is in his car, informs Hani over the phone that Yenipang has left and that he's parked outside Rant's daycare, ready to take her home. After ending the call, he reflects on how he needs to take action now that Yenipang has returned to her own life. Although he had many plans for his sabbatical, his thoughts now revolve around Hani and Ran. He wants to go on trips, eat delicious food, and watch enjoyable movies with them. His solo dreams have transformed into desires to spend time with his new family, as his ultimate goal is to become a good father. Recalling his conversation with Deokjin, Jun realizes he needs to find a job. Just then, he notices that Rant's daycare has closed for the day. When Rant spots him, she runs into his arms, calling him daddy. The teachers begin to gossip, 
speculating that he's actually Rant's uncle and that they're not blood-related despite their resemblance. They also mention that Rant's aunt is her mom's friend and that June is the aunt's younger brother, musing that they must be incredibly close for him to pick Rant up from daycare. The teachers start to wonder if June might actually be Rant's father, but they quickly decide to drop the subject, knowing that Songkyung has a short fuse. Later, as Jun picks up Hani from work and drives them home, he reveals his plans to find a job soon. He mentions Deokjun's proposal and promises to discuss the details with her later. Jun also drops the bombshell that Deokjun knows he is Rant's father, which leaves Hani shocked. He explains that Deokjun had suspicions even before Ran was born, which is why he welcomed Hani into his home. Jun suggests telling Hani's parents and Songkyung the truth during Chuseok, hoping for Ran to be accepted quickly. Although Hani agrees, she can't help but feel uneasy and wonders why Deokjun kept it from Songkyung. Jun reassures her, saying it's not like they'll die from this. Overhearing their conversation, Ran starts to cry, asking if her mommy and daddy will die. They quickly console her, saying that's not the case. After Jun finishes washing up Ran, Hani thanks him for his help and tells him to head upstairs to sleep. He remembers he still needs to hang the curtains and promises to do it the next day. As he bids Ran goodnight, she clings to his legs, insisting they all sleep together because she's afraid they'll die. Tears well up in her eyes, tugging at their heartstrings. So, they all crawl into bed, with Ran nestled between them. Despite their best efforts, Hani and Jun struggle to fall asleep. Ran accidentally kicks Jun in her sleep, causing Hani to laugh. She tells him he can go upstairs if he's uncomfortable, but when she opens her eyes, she finds him lying right in front of her. Surprised, she asks what he's doing, but he ignores her question and pulls her close. She protests, but he shushes her, not wanting to wake Ran. He admits it's difficult for him and tells her to relax, which reminds Hani of what Yenipang told her. Curiously, she slips her hand under his shirt, catching him off guard. He quickly pulls away, demanding to know what she's doing. She asks where he had surgery, trying to touch him again, but he scoots further away. Determined, she calls him back, and when he refuses, she goes to him and yanks up his shirt. He yells at her to stop just as the pain starts to resurface. He pleads with her not to touch his body, tears streaming down his face. Hani asks if what Yenipang said was true and inquires about the type of surgery he had, causing him to blush. She begs him to let her see where he had the surgery, her curiosity getting the best of her. Hani insists that Jun needs to take care of himself and offers to help, but he stubbornly refuses, saying he'll try to overcome it on his own. She lifts his shirt to check his back, but he grabs her hand and maneuvers them so he's on top of her. He asks if she would sleep with him, leaving her shocked. When she stammers and asks what that has to do with their current situation, he lies, wondering if she would leave him if she found out he couldn't have more children besides Ran. In his head, he apologizes for not being able to tell her the truth, realizing he can't go on without her and Ran. Deciding not to push the issue further, Hani tells him to at least visit the hospital, and he agrees. Suddenly, Ran wakes up, sees them in that position, and starts crying, thinking her parents are dead. They quickly rush to comfort her, assuring her they're very much alive. The next day, while grocery shopping, Songkyung runs into someone from Ran's daycare. The woman mentions that Songkyung hasn't been picking up Ran lately, and instead, her uncle does it every day. She asks if Jun is really Ran's uncle or Song Kyung's younger brother. Song Kyung explains that they're as close as family, and Jun is practically Ran's uncle. The woman gushes over how caring Jun is and comments on how much he and Ran resemble each other, even mistaking him for Ran's father. Song Kyung glares at the woman, firmly stating that Ran has a father. Feeling intimidated, the woman mentions the rumors circulating about Jun being Rant's real dad, which infuriates Song Kyung. Meanwhile, Jun takes Hani's advice and sees a doctor, who assures him there's no problem with the area he had surgery. In fact, the supermarket on the other side is more active, 
meaning June can have children, much to his delight. The doctor congratulates him and asks why he didn't come in sooner. When June inquires about the persistent pain, the doctor suggests it could be sensitivity to different hormones during the healing process or, more likely, mental trauma. The doctor asks if June has been under any psychological stress or pressure. June reflects on losing his job, discovering Ran is his daughter, waiting for Hani in the rain, and learning that Diokjin knew he was Rant's father. He admits there's been a lot going on but believes he's fine now. The doctor warns that June might just think he's better while his body catches up with his mind. As June leaves, he recalls the doctor's advice to reduce stress and consult his lover to work through it together. June knows he can't tell Hani or Songkyung about what happened. Suddenly, Songkyung calls, yelling at him for picking up Ran from daycare and asking if he's aware of the rumors about him being Ran's father. He tells her not to care about what others say, but she argues that it's the perfect time to care, especially after sending Yenipeng away and questioning if he plans to marry. She demands he move out immediately, blaming the rumors on his proximity to Hani. When Songkyung asks if he and Hani are dating, Jun counters by asking if he can't date Hani or be Rant's father, infuriating her. She declares she's coming over to talk face to face, prompting Jun to race to his car, claiming he's not home. Song Kyung vows to wait for him at his house and hangs up. Meanwhile, Hani, swamped at work, misses the calls. Both Song Kyung and Jun speed towards the apartment, but Song Kyung arrives first. She rings Jun's doorbell, and a woman answers, surprising her. Song Kyung asks if it's Jun's house, and the woman, in turn, asks if she's talking about the kid's father next door, leaving Song Kyung even more stunned. Song Kyung's heart races as she types in the passcode to Hani's apartment, but to her dismay, it doesn't work. She tries several combinations, and in a moment of desperation, she enters Jun's military serial number. To her surprise, the door clicks open. As she steps inside, everything appears normal at first glance. But then, her eyes land on the curtains Jun had hung up. Curiosity peaked. She ventures upstairs and pulls back the curtain, only to be stunned by the sight of June's belongings and a heartwarming picture Ran had drawn of the three of them together. The realization hits her like a ton of bricks, are they living together? In her shock, Song Kyung stumbles and tumbles down the stairs, her back throbbing with pain. But the physical discomfort pales in comparison to the anger and betrayal coursing through her veins. She's been tricked. June arrives at the apartment, breathless and relieved that he had the foresight to change the passcode. But a nagging feeling in the back of his mind suggests that Song Kyung might still remember his military serial number. Cautiously, he opens the door, calling out to see if anyone is inside. Met with silence, he collapses on the floor, relief washing over him. That is, until he notices the open curtain. The realization that Song Kyung must have entered the house sends him scrambling for his phone to call Hani. Hani, engrossed in preparing coffee for Song Kyung, ignores Jun's call. She casually inquires about the reason for Song Kyung's visit, and Song Kyung suggests they go out together if Hani isn't too busy. Hani agrees, just needing to tidy up her work first. In search of a tray, she grabs the nearest thing at hand a boy love Mangda Diokjin had given June before his trip to China and uses it to serve the coffee to Song Kyung. As Song Kyung reaches for the coffee, a sharp pain shoots through her body, but she brushes it aside, consumed by thoughts of Hani's betrayal after everything she had done for her and ran. In her mind, Hani should let June go, especially considering their age difference and the fact that Hani has ran to care for. Despite the unforgivable nature of their actions, Song Kyung resolves to talk to Hani first, knowing that Jun is as inflexible as a bamboo. Absent-mindedly, she picks up the manga, curious about its ending. Flipping through the pages, Song Kyung pauses at a scene that feels all too familiar. The male lead discusses his next-door neighbor, who has received an offer to study abroad in Hollywood. Later, the male lead falls ill and it's revealed that the neighbor had left, and they had broken up. Song Kyung closes the book, a sense of deja vu washing over her. 
Suddenly, a memory surfaces a similar conversation with Hani on the day she discovered her pregnancy. The pieces start to fall into place, and Songkyung wonders if Hani had simply recounted the manga story to her. A chilling thought crosses her mind, who is Rant's real father? The woman from the supermarket's words echo in her head, suggesting that Jun seemed like Rant's true father. With trembling hands, Songkyung picks up her coffee cup and asks Hani about Rant's blood type. Hani absentmindedly responds, type A. The sound of Songkyung's coffee cup shattering on the floor jolts Hani into action. She rushes to Songkyung's side, armed with a box of tissues, and begins wiping away the spilled coffee. Songkyung, her voice barely above a whisper, asks if Hani's blood type is O. Hani, puzzled by the question, inquires why she's asking. Songkyung's response leaves Hani reeling, Ran shares the same blood type as her and Jun. Hani tries to reassure Songkyung, pointing out that many people share the same blood type. But Songkyung isn't having it. She pushes Hani's hand away and abruptly leaves, claiming she forgot about something important. As soon as she's gone, Hani's mind starts racing. Does Songkyung know the truth about Jun being Rant's father? Songkyung's thoughts are in a whirlwind as she drives home. She remembers Jun questioning why he can't date Hani or be Rant's father. But that doesn't make sense, does it? For years ago, before Ran was born, Hani had only just met Jun at Songkyung's house. Then, a memory strikes her like lightning. That night, she had seen men's clothes in Hani's house, and when she called, she heard a male voice. Could it have been Jun? Slamming on the brakes, Songkyung sits in her car, fuming with anger. She vows to keep her promise to her father, no matter what. The next day, at Songkyung's house, Deokjin is sprawled on the couch, feeling awful. He calls out to Songkyung for help, but she's lost in her own thoughts, muttering it couldn't be under her breath. Deokjin staggers to the kitchen, clutching his throat, and asks where the painkillers are. Songkyung snaps at him to find them himself and to stop bothering her. She storms off, slamming the bathroom door behind her. In the bathroom, Songkyung's mind is still reeling. Is Jun really Rant's father? Her eyes land on Rant's toothbrush, and she knows she has to find out for sure. Just as she starts looking for Jun's toothbrush, a loud noise startles her. She rushes out to investigate and finds Deokjin unconscious on the floor. Days later, Hani and Jun visit Deokjin in the hospital. Hani gently scolds him for not telling her he was sick and expresses her surprise at Songkyung's radio silence. Deokjin brushes it off, saying it was just a temporary allergic reaction. He asks about Ran, and Jun looks around for Songkyung. Deokjin mentions she went out for some air and is likely in the lounge. In the lounge, Songkyung anxiously checks her phone, waiting for the DNA test results. She tells herself not to doubt anyone until the truth is revealed. Hani sits beside her and asks why she's been ignoring her calls. Songkyung cuts to the chase, asking if Hani and Jun are living together. Hani is shocked but admits they were planning to tell her at Chuseok. Songkyung is furious, questioning Hani's intentions and demanding she let Jun go. Hani tries to explain, but Songkyung won't hear it. She accuses Hani of betraying her trust and demands she move out immediately. Hani stands her ground, saying it's Jun's decision. Songkyung is about to explode when her phone rings. The person on the other end confirms the DNA test results, Ran is Jun's daughter. Songkyung staggers in shock, and Hani reaches out to steady her. But Songkyung is beyond reason. She tells Hani she's crossed the line and gives her an ultimatum, let Jun go or leave the company and her life forever. Jun bursts onto the scene, demanding to know what Songkyung is doing. He stands in front of Hani, arms outstretched, shielding her from his sister's wrath. Songkyung's hand cracks across his face as she asks if he's Rant's father. Jun is stunned, wondering how she found out. Seething with anger, Songkyung asks why he deceived her. Jun sits the women down and drops the bombshell, Ran is his child, and he's going to marry Hani. Songkyung's fury reaches new heights. 
Hani tries to explain that she never meant for Songkyung to find out this way and that Jun didn't know about Ran until he returned from China. Songkyung feels utterly betrayed. She welcomed Hani and Ran into her home, cared for them with love, and now she feels like a fool. Hani insists that wasn't the case she was in a tough spot, had no one to turn to, and didn't want to burden her parents. Plus, Songkyung was Jun's sister and her friend. But Songkyung isn't buying it. If Hani truly saw her as a friend, she wouldn't have let things escalate like this. Jun takes the blame, saying Hani never asked him to take responsibility for Ran, but he can't imagine his life without them. He drops to his knees, begging Songkyung to accept them and think of Ran. Songkyung reminds Jun that she raised him well, even without children of her own, so she could face their late father with pride. She devoted her life to him, and this is how he repays her? Hani's had enough. She shouts at Song Kyung, demanding to know what's so wrong with her and what's so great about Jun. Besides their age difference, what makes her insufficient? Song Kyung can't believe what she's hearing. Is this a joke to Hani? Hani doubles down, declaring she's not leaving the company and questioning Song Kyung's authority. She tells her to get Deokjin and threatens to report her to the Ministry of Labor. June tries to calm Hani down, but she's on a roll. The women are in a full-blown screaming match, yanking June's hair when he tries to intervene. It's not until Deokjin yells at them to stop that they finally pause. Hani glares at Songkyung before storming off. June starts to follow, but Songkyung grabs him. He removes her hand, apologizing and telling her he's not the little brother she once looked after. He may be unemployed, but he's going to step up as a dad and repay everything she's done for him. Song Kyung doesn't want repayment, she wants him to live his life, as their father would have wanted. Jun says goodbye to Deok Jin and leaves. Deok Jin sighs in relief, glad everything is out in the open. He asks Song Kyung if Hani and Jun don't suit each other, saying it's something to celebrate. Song Kyung explodes, revealing that Ran is Jun's daughter. Deok Jin calmly asks if she can't see how considerate Hani and Jun are being to each other. It dawns on Song Kyung that he knew all along. Deok Jin tells her she's done all she could and should live her life as Jun said. Song Kyung feels utterly betrayed, hitting Deok Jin and accusing him of tricking her. He insists he never tricked her, just let things unfold naturally. He asks her to think about him, even just a little, but she's too focused on June Deokjin resignedly heads back inside. In the parking lot, June catches up to Hani and asks why she took all that abuse from Songkyung when she could have called him. Hani breaks down in tears, and June holds her. She says she wants to see her mom, and June suggests they introduce Ran to her grandmother. That night, they arrive at Hani's parents' house. Her mother and father rush out, thrilled to see Ran. Hani's mother embraces Jun, whom she hasn't seen since his return from China. Then, Jun salutes Hani's parents, calling them mother-in-law and father-in-law, much to their surprise. Hani's father sees red when he learns that Jun is Ran's father. He pummels Jun while Hani's mother hurls objects at him. Hani desperately tries to explain that Jun only found out about Ran after returning from China. Her mother demands to know why she kept it a secret, wondering if Hani thought they'd oppose the relationship. Amidst the chaos, little Ran's voice rings out, pleading for the fighting to stop. The adults, chastened, compose themselves. Hani's father suggests they sit down and have a civilized conversation. Once everyone has settled, Hani's mother asks her to explain why she hid Rant's father's identity. Hani drops a bombshell, she did it because of them. Her parents are stunned. Hani elaborates, saying they married out of obligation when she was conceived, raising her out of duty and separating when she turned 20. She didn't want that life with June, so she chose to raise Ran alone, determined not to regret having her. Hani's mother insists they don't regret having her, but Hani accuses her of lying. Hani's father, his voice thick with emotion, tells her she's the most precious thing in his life and apologizes if their choices hurt her. 
Tears well up in Hani's eyes as she apologizes, saying she didn't mean the hurtful things she just said. Jun and Ran console her, but her tears seem to ignite her mother's anger. She tells Hani they were content raising her and simply chose to pursue their own lives afterward. She asks if they look miserable to Hani. Hani questions why her parents are together, and Jun chimes in, equally surprised, asking if they reconciled. Hani's father reveals he came to see photos of Ran, while her mother complains that she always tells him to upgrade his phone. Hani mentions an album of Ran's first birthday photos, but her mother dismisses them as old. She explains that since Hani rarely sends pictures, Sangkyung told her about a daycare app where new photos of Ran are posted daily. Hani's father visits every day to see them on Hani's mother's phone since he doesn't have a smartphone. Hani can't help but think Sangkyung is more of a daughter to them than she is, while Jun silently apologizes to his sister. Back at the hospital, as Deokjin sleeps, Sangkyung lies awake, recalling Jun's words about living her life. She thinks bitterly that he created this mess and has the audacity to tell her how to live, convinced their father never wanted this for her. In a flashback, Sangkyung and Jun's father is writing something while coughing. Hearing someone approach, he quickly hides the paper in a drawer. Sangkyung bursts in, excitedly announcing her college acceptance with Hani, expecting her father to share in her joy. Instead, he questions if she really needs to go to college and if she's not worried about Jun Songkyung, trembling, tells him she won't yield on college. He asks if she has tuition money because he doesn't. Furious, she declares she doesn't need his money and storms out to find a part-time job in town. After she leaves, her father opens the drawer, only to hastily close it when Songkyung suddenly returns. She asks why he didn't eat the food she prepared, and he claims he forgot. She wonders if he skipped meals due to lack of appetite again. He grumbles about a girl lecturing him and gets up to eat. Once he's gone, Song Kyung, suspecting he's hiding something, opens the drawer and finds his bank book. The amount of money inside leaves her stunned. When Song Kyung returns home, she finds her father waiting for her in the cold. He demands to know if she saw his bank book. She ignores him and tries to walk away, but he angrily repeats the question. Song Kyung yells back, admitting she took the money to pay for her college tuition. She argues that he should have given her the money instead of saving it for June, who didn't even finish middle school. She reminds him that she's his child too, not just June's mother. Her father simply tells her she did well and starts coughing. Song Kyung asks if he's sick, but he brushes it off as a cold and heads inside. She tells him she'll pay him back and isn't sorry for what she did. He just wants to go inside because it's cold. That was the last time Song Kyung saw her father's back. While she and Hani were living it up in Seoul, Jun was caring for their terminally ill father. The money was meant for his surgery. Before he died, Jun's father made him promise not to tell Song Kyung about his illness, believing that if Song Kyung did well, Jun would too. At the funeral, Song Kyung receives a letter from her father. He thanks her for taking care of Jun like a mother and tells her to use the bank book money for tuition, find a nice husband in Seoul, and have a happy family. He asks her to look after Jun until he graduates, gets a job, meets a nice girl and has a happy family one nothing like the one with an abusive father like him. He apologizes for leaving only the bank book and thanks her for living with a terrible father. Song Kyung breaks down, believing that if she hadn't gone to college, her father would have had the surgery and lived. Hani's father tries to console her, saying the letter shows her father never intended to have the surgery and planned to give her the money all along. But Song Kyung can't stop blaming herself, her bad memories of her father fade, and the few good ones become clearer. Whenever they do, she devotes herself to Jun. She thinks Jun can't do this to her after she took care of him and Hani. She can't forgive them. At Hani's mother's house, Jun and Hani's father make dumplings while Ran plays with a dough bunny. Hani's father asks when Jun plans to marry Hani, suggesting he do it before Ran grows up. Jun says Hani hasn't accepted yet, and while he wants to marry immediately, 
he needs to get a job first. He asks if Hani's father is using Rant's photos as an excuse to see Hani's mother. Hani's father denies it, refusing June's offer of a new phone, insisting his cracked one is fine. When June bumps into Ran, breaking her bunny's ear, Hani's father tries to hit him. Outside, Hani and her mother drink coffee. Hani asks how long her mother will keep up this arrangement with her father. Her mother says it's getting cold, going out is annoying, and she's bored, so living with Hani's father as friends seems fine and saves on heating bills. Hani questions what married couple acts like that. Her mother explains that marriage is about being there for each other when needed, taking each other's side. Hani had dreamed of a more romantic marriage when she was younger. Her mother mentions June wanting to marry her, and Hani asks if she wants her to get married. Her mother admits she never imagined June as Rant's father but has no reason to dislike him. She's more worried about Song Kyung's opposition. Hani reveals that's already happened. When her mother offers to talk to Song Kyung, Hani declines. Hani asks if she has to get married. Her mother asks if she dislikes June, and when Hani says no, her mother wonders if it's still because of her and Hani's father. Hani fears hating June while living with him. Her mother suggests divorce if they don't get along and questions when Hani became a coward. Hani doesn't know. Her mother says she can't lecture a daughter who got hurt because of her and goes inside. Hani thinks marriage is the right choice for Ran and June, but what about her own life and choices? The scent of rosemary, which she transplanted after Ran kept knocking over the flower pot, drifts over. Looking at the blooming flowers, Hani realizes she wants to live without losing herself. Hani ponders whether marriage really matters, as long as they care for each other and she doesn't lose herself in the family. Suddenly, June wraps his arms around her from behind, asking what she's doing in the cold. She says she's about to head inside, and he suggests they go on a date the next day, just the two of them, without Ran. The following morning, Deokjin wakes up alone in his hospital room. He calls Song Kyung, but she doesn't answer. He wonders where she could be. Meanwhile, Song Kyung drives out of Seoul, fuming with anger, thinking she can't forgive Hani. At Hani's mother's house, her mom feeds Ran, wondering if Hani and June will be okay since they left without breakfast. Hani's father assures her they'll be fine, even if they don't eat. The mother praises Ran for eating well and not making a fuss when her parents aren't around. Ran proudly declares that her daddy told her to behave with Grammy and Grandpa. Then, she excitedly announces that daddy is going to poposu, meaning propose. The grandparents are left puzzled by the meaning of poposu as Ran gleefully repeats the word. When Hani and June arrive at Nami Island, June sends Hani to get the boat tickets while he heads to the bathroom. Once she's gone, he retrieves a ring box from the glove compartment. He worries that he couldn't give it to her, fearing her refusal, and feels like if he doesn't do it today, he may never muster the courage. Later, on the boat, Hani stands gazing at the sea when June hugs her from behind, asking if her hands are cold and telling her to put them in his pocket. He thinks all she has to do is grab the ring, but she walks away, suggesting they go inside. As they stroll through the woods, surrounded by stunning autumn leaves, June proposes they find a spot with fewer people, but Hani is too engrossed in taking pictures to listen. He poses, saying they should talk, but she continues snapping away. Later, they eat at a restaurant serving food and lunchboxes. June had planned to hide the ring in a cake, but the lunchbox setup foils his plan, leaving him disappointed. Hani notices his discomfort and offers to head back if he's tired. He quickly declines, realizing that despite suggesting the date, he got so caught up in giving her the ring that he forgot about her. Two hours earlier, when Hani went to get the boat tickets, she realized she forgot her scarf and returned to the car, catching June looking at the ring. On the boat, she wondered if he was planning to propose when he hugged her from behind. So, when he told her to put her hand in his pocket, she walked away, certain he was going to propose, and pondered what she would do. As they eat, June tells himself to finish quickly and give her the ring, 
while Hani thinks he's being obvious. Back at Hani's mother's house, the grandparents prepare to take Ran shopping for food. Ran asks her Grammy what her parents will do if they return and she's not there. Grammy assures her they'll call, as she buckles Ran into the car. Suddenly remembering she forgot her phone, Grammy rushes back inside. Hani's father questions the point of a smartphone if she always forgets it. His stomach grumbles, so he tells Ran he needs to use the restroom and warns her to stay put before dashing away. Suddenly, Song Kyung knocks on the window and tells Ran to be quiet. Meanwhile, as Hani and June stroll through the woods, Hani's mind is in overdrive. Should she accept or refuse June's proposal? Will their relationship stay the same if they get married? Will her life become stagnant? And what about Song Kyung, will she ever approve of Hani? But then it hits her, what matters most is how she feels. Marriage or not, as long as they care for each other, she can trust him. June notices Hani's silence and asks what's wrong. She turns the tables, asking if he has something to tell her. He drops a bombshell, he recently went to the hospital. Hani's thoughts race, is it about his injury? Is this not a proposal after all? June reveals that due to his accident, he believed he could never have children again. Hani's eyes dart to his crotch, and he quickly covers it, assuring her he's healed. She demands to know why he's just telling her this and if he's truly okay. He insists he's fine and thought he could finally approach her with confidence. Hani presses for more details from the doctor. June admits there's no problem with the surgery, but there's a psychological issue due to the pain. Hani flashes back to the night she touched him and how he begged her to stop because of the intense pain. She asks if it hurt a lot, and he confesses it's becoming more bearable. He credits Ran for his recovery, saying his life lost all meaning when he thought he couldn't have children. He thanks Hani for saving him by having Ran. Hani wonders if he wanted to date her because he thought Ran was his only chance at fatherhood. June vehemently denies it, explaining that at first, he wanted to date her out of responsibility, but now it's because of who she is. Ran is lovable because she's their daughter. Hani accuses him of lying, and he pulls her close, saying he brought this up because he wanted to be totally honest with her. She pushes him away, thinking she won't marry him. June realizes Hani can't trust him yet and promises to wait until she can. Suddenly, Hani's phone rings. It's her mother, frantically telling her Ran has disappeared. Hani's shocked, how could Ran vanish when she's at home? June grabs the phone, asking what's going on. Hani's mother explains they were about to go to the market, but when they looked away for a moment, Ran was gone. Hani's father has been searching for an hour, even going to the community hall for a broadcast and the police station. June asks if Song Kyung visited. Hani's mother says Song Kyung called to apologize for not coming to Chuseok and asked if Hani and June were there. When she said yes, Song Kyung abruptly ended the call. June suspects Song Kyung took Ran and tries to call her, but she doesn't pick up. He decides to call Deokjin. Meanwhile, Ran, munching on snacks in the back of Song Kyung's car, asks if her parents are waiting for her. Song Kyung says they are and tells Ran to sleep if she's tired. Later, Song Kyung parks on the side of the road, watching Ran sleep. She realizes she took Ran in anger and wonders what to do with her. As she reaches out to Ran, calling herself her real aunt, Deokjin calls. Deokjin demands to know where Song Kyung is and if Ran is with her. Song Kyung asks if he's been discharged and says she's on her way back. Deokjin says that's not the issue and asks why she took Ran without saying anything. Song Kyung says she was going to discuss it with him at home and suggests they adopt Ran. Deokjin is baffled. Song Kyung insists she's serious at first, she took Ran out of anger, but now she thinks it's for the best. She argues that Hani and Jun are young, while she and Deokjin are childless. Deokjin says she's lost it and threatens divorce if she doesn't return Ran to her parents. Song Kyung says she won't come home until he agrees and tells him to message her when he changes his mind. She hangs up and checks on Ran, but the car is empty. 
Just a few minutes earlier, little Ran had woken up desperate for the loo, but her aunt Songkyung was nowhere in sight. The kid had no choice but to hop out of the car and go hunting for a restroom. Now she finds herself alone in a bustling business district, searching high and low without any luck. Finally, Ran approaches a passing woman to ask for directions. The kind stranger points her towards the facilities, probably wondering where on earth Rant's mom has wandered off to. Meanwhile, Samkyun arrives at the same crowded center, frantically calling out Rant's name. Elsewhere, June and Hani are soulbound when Hani gets Deokjin on the line. He tries to reassure her since Samkyun is supposedly watching Ran, but Hani pushes for details on Songkyung's whereabouts. Deokjin admits he doesn't know her exact location and promises to call back if she checks in again. No sooner has he said that than Songkyung's call comes through to Hani. She immediately hangs up on poor Deokjin to take it, only for Songkyung to drop the bombshell Ran has wandered off. Hani is floored. Back in the parking lot, a lost and confused Ran roams between the hundreds of lookalike cars, struggling to find her aunts. She finally spots one she thinks matches and hops right in. The driver, who'd been catching some shut-eye, jolts awake at the sound of his door slamming shut. Figuring it's nothing, he starts driving off, mind on grabbing a snack. Only when he glances in the rearview mirror does he notice the tiny stowaway in his back seat. The poor guy nearly jumps out of his skin before demanding to know who this random kid is. That's when a frightened Ran bursts into tears. An urgent announcement rings out through the business center a four-year-old girl has gone missing, complete with a description of Rant's clothes and a plea to take her to the info desk if found. All the while, a trembling Songkyung sits wondering if she's somehow failed her niece. At the rest stop, the driver gently asks the weeping Ran if she doesn't have some child locator device, only for her to yell that she isn't lost and knows her mommy's number by heart. Just as Songkyun considers calling the police, Hani and Jun come rushing in bellowing her name. Hani grabs Songkyun by the shirt, yelling threats even as Songkyun dissolves into sobs. That's when Hani's phone starts ringing it's Ran screaming mommy. The driver quickly explains he means no harm and gives Hani his location after she confirms being Ran's mom. Once Jun gets the details, he thanks the man profusely before turning to see Songkyun collapsed on the floor crying her eyes out. Hani walks over and kneels down beside her distraught friend. An hour later, Ran happily plays with the balloon the well-meaning driver has bought her while they await her parents' arrival. The restless man wonders what could possibly be keeping them, telling Ran to quit bugging him and sit still. Seconds after, Hani, Jun, and Songkyung come racing up, shouting Ran's name. The ecstatic little girl takes off running towards them, oblivious to the approaching car. Its horn blares just as Songkyung flings herself in front of Ran, shielding her niece with her own body. Jun races towards them, but Hani's cry of his name comes too late the car clips him head on. He crumples to the ground, bleeding from the head as Hani bolts to his side. Little Ran wails in the arms of a prone Songkyung. Cradling Jun's body, Hani's own tears stream down her cheeks. Through a blurry haze, Jun meets her gaze, trying to reassure her that it'll be all right. He musters what strength he has left to raise a trembling hand towards her beautiful face, desperate to give her the ring, but loses consciousness before he can, leaving Hani screaming his name in anguish. Hours later at the hospital, a pacing Deokjin bounces a sleeping Ran in his arms as he waits. Beside him, Hani sits vigil, stoic except for the occasional sniffle. Songkyung can't stop her sobbing guilt-wracked cries about being responsible for this nightmare. An annoyed Hani finally snaps that she needs to quit the waterworks, the doctor said June's surgery was routine. But Songkyung frets that it's been three hours already, so something must have gone wrong. Hani rebukes her sharply for courting bad luck with that kind of talk before pulling the distraught woman into an embrace insisting June will emerge grinning like nothing happened. Another agonizing hour crawls by before Hani finally gets to see June, still unconscious post-op, Songkyun wordlessly stares at the scene, ran in her arms. Then she reminds Hani that by her own logic, 
The tears risk jinxing June's recovery now that the surgery went smoothly. Hani lashes out at her apparent heartlessness, can't she see the cast on June's leg? Song Kim reasons that the doctor said it wouldn't impact his life, and that's why they need to wake him from the anesthesia. No matter how hard Hani tries rousing him though, June just mumbles Nuna and slips back under. That's when the doctor and nurse arrive, alarmed that the patient is still asleep. The physician announces June's MRI results are clear aside from the neatly repaired thigh fracture, then stops himself mid-rambling about supposed testicle surgery details that clearly catch June's attention, eyes flashing open. Song Kyung can't resist a peal of laughter at the absurd suggestion before demanding to know just when June had any such operation. He ignores her, grilling the doctor on what the real issue is. The flustered doctor hastily backtracks, stammering it's nothing as the nurse shushes him about keeping patient confidentiality. They exit, leaving Song Kyung to pursue the surgery question relentlessly until June confesses that yes, it happened when he first returned from China after a mishap, but turned out fine. Her yelling intensifies, how much more is he hiding? Sitting upright, June placates that he has no other secrets, save for the bombshell that he can never have children of his own, leaving Song Kyung stunned. Hani whispers a reminder that June had assured her everything was functional down there. He murmurs back about taking this chance to stand firm in their relationship. Meanwhile, Song Kyung reels from the realization that she's not alone in her infertility struggles. June adds that Ran is his entire world now, and without Hani, he'd never have a child to call his own. Pulling his fiancée close, he tells Song Kyung to abandon any notions of driving a wedge between them even if he groveled at her feet, it would never be enough. All Song Kyung can do is gape at them in shell-shocked silence. Song Kyung storms out of the room, brushing right past her husband without so much as a glance. Deok Jin figures she's still out of it and seizes the moment he grabs her hand and tells her to follow him, he's got something for her. In the car, he hands her a ledger, explaining it's a record of all the cash she's been pocketing from his safe. Song Kyung is floored as she flips through the pages, demanding to know how long he's been tracking this and why he let it go on. Deok Jin replies that he knows the money was going toward Jun's tuition, but what he can't figure out is why she didn't just ask him for it. Her voice trembles as she confesses that after failing to give him a child, how could she bring up needing funds? He didn't want kids, did he? Not want kids? Deok Jin insists it wasn't that he just didn't want to add to her anxiety and stress. Then he asks if she wants to know his first thought looking at this ledger. He suspected she married him for his money, not for him that maybe she never even loved him at all. His voice rising, he yells that he's given her his everything, bending over backwards to support her ambitions. He's a man who craves affection, and their very first date, watching how lovingly she treated her brother as an only child made him jealous. He dreamed if she could shower that much warmth, he'd be one happy guy which is why he proposed. Deok Jin shoves an envelope her way, stating he wants her to be free from him and her brother's burden. All she has to do is sign the enclosed papers that he's already signed, and they can move on with their lives separately starting today. Song Kyung wonders aloud if these are divorce papers as Deok Jin lays blame for every marital failure at her feet. She pleads that she's in a difficult place right now, how can he do this to her? He apologizes but insists she sign within the week so he can submit them. She screams she'll do no such thing June may have flown the coop long ago, but Deok Jin is all she has left. Song Kyung begs to go back to how they used to be. Deok Jin asks if she can handle not seeing June for a while then. When she balks at taking such an extreme step, he sighs that he'd hoped his words could get through to her and demands the papers back. She starts ripping them up as he shouts they cost him a fortune, wrestling to pry them from her grasp. Song Kyung holds them high, defiantly vowing to shred every last page as Deok Jin shouts that their plane tickets no divorce papers, just travel docs from an agency. She frantically examines the contents as Deok Jin tenderly brushes back her hair, suggesting they take a much-needed vacation to recharge. Song Kyung is dumbfounded, was this some kind of sick joke? 
He explains he figured this was the only way to get through to her stubborn head. He'd already told June his plan to globetrot for a while and map out life's next chapter. When she'd assumed they were divorce papers, he admits he'd briefly considered splitting when she brought up adopting Ran, but hated complicated crap like that. So he decided to mentally divorce her in his head first, and now they can start fresh. This time, he's reproposing to her properly. Song Kyung marvels at how she failed to see Deokjin waiting patiently all this time before falling into his embrace, vowing to live eyes only for him from now on. At the hospital, Hani watches a sleeping Ran finally at peace after one hell of a stressful day, while Jun fills his mother in on the phone about his condition. She explains they can't come tonight since Hani's dad can't drive after dark due to his poor eyesight, but they'll be first thing in the morning. After hanging up, June pats the empty space beside him, beckoning Hani to join him. She refuses, claiming it's too cramped, as he dramatically shifts his body to prove otherwise. Don't move so much, you'll reopen your stitches, she chides. He tugs her onto the bed beside him, he has something to get off his chest first, but will she take responsibility for hurt feelings? Hani begrudgingly obliges, and June confesses that when he thought he might die, he regretted not telling her something. When she demands to know what, he admits he wanted a chance to say how lucky he felt to have met and loved her before the end. He takes her hand in his, and as she raises it to gaze at the ring, he clasps it gently. Just being by Hani's side is enough, he thinks to himself more than enough. Tenderly, he tells her I love you. Tears well up in her eyes as she recalls how his accident made her realize just how much regret she'd feel if he was gone. Her voice cracks as she proposes they should get married. June is caught off guard, so she kneels right there on the bed and asks again, causing his own tears to threaten falling. Smiling through her joy, Hani leans in for a kiss, thinking he can cry as long as she gets to share that smile. One month later, from little Rant's perspective, the day her dad got out of the hospital was the same day he and her mom officially got hitched hence why they were a bit late picking her up from daycare. You didn't want a big wedding? June asks Hani teasingly. She blushes, retorting they can't afford such an extravagance right now with a playful threat on his life if he calls her Honey again. Rant's name changes from M.O. Ran to Kong M.O. Ran as her parents start using silly pet names like Honey with increasing frequency. During chores, Hani will scold June for grinding his teeth at night, calling him Honey only for him to fire back about her nightly flatulence. That was Ran, not me. Hani insists indignantly. Though Ran knows her mom's the liar there. Whenever they bicker, dad beckons Ran over while mom demands to know whose side she's on mommy or daddy's. Unable to choose, Ran just cries that she hates them both equally since it's the hardest decision ever for her. At bedtime, Dad always asks Mom if she's sleeping yet. No, she'll mutter. Then he turns to Ran, are you sleeping? When she opens her eyes and shakes her head no, he'll remind her in a fatherly tone that good kids her age better be snoozing by now. A month later, Auntie Songkyung and Uncle Deokjin jet off on an international adventure. Song Kim promises to bring Ran back a mountain of souvenirs, but the kid's more interested in what Santa's bringing for Christmas just around the corner. While out shopping, Hani suddenly freezes in the wine aisle, having spotted Dong Jin and he Ju further down. Jun suggests saying hi, but Hani shoves him the other way, leave them be. According to Ran's childish logic, everyone's all smiles during the holidays because Santa definitely doesn't deliver to crybabies. After New Year's, June's schedule kicks into overdrive. His mornings start with a video call to Deokjin before heading to the print shop, squeezing in seminars and business meetings where he learns by doing. But since he picks up Ran from daycare, Hani can finally attend her dream school program. They split housework and childcare duties evenly by day of the week. Whenever it's June's turn, Hani seizes the free time to take online classes herself, one night as he's logging off, a notification from Yenipang pops up clicking through, June is shocked to see a photo of Yenipang canoodling with Son Jun Ki. 
June reads the buzzy article about Korean superstar Son Joon Ki's hot new international romance with Chinese TV host Yana Pang. He can't help but grin looks like she finally found her happiness this time. Later, he shows the piece to Hani, who can scarcely believe they're talking about the same Yana Pang she knew. You don't regret losing her, do you? Hani prods. She's dating literal Son Joon Ki. Joon scoffs playfully. How cool must I be for an amazing woman like Yena Pang to have gone for me in the first place? Hani ribs him for his overinflated ego, only for Jun to flip it around, well just how wonderful must you be to be loved by such a stud? They dissolve into laughter and kisses until little Ran interrupts, demanding smooches of her own. As Jun dotes on their daughter, Hani's phone starts ringing its deoction, sobbing Songkyung's name in a frenzy that sets off alarm bells. But then he blurts out the news, Song Kyung's pregnant. Hani and Jun are floored, congratulating him profusely. Deok Jun puts Song Kyung on so Hani can squeal her well wishes, pressing for details on when this miracle occurred. Song Kyung confesses she hasn't even seen a doctor yet, but every home test was positive. I should have booked us that vacation sooner. Hani teases. Song Kyung agrees sticking to a low-stress regimen of good food and relaxation seemed to do the trick when she'd given up hoping. As Hani moves to hand the phone to Jun, Song Kyung stops her, she owes Hani something first. Song Kyung admits that in kidnapping Ran, she must have temporarily lost her mind. Back then, Hani and Jun's domestic bliss was the picture-perfect family she could never imagine having but now she sees how truly right they are for each other and wishes them every happiness. All Song Kim can do is apologize. The next day at a family lunch, Hani's parents are floored to hear about Song Kim's surprise pregnancy. Then Hani's mother broaches the subject they've been avoiding, don't you two want to have a proper wedding ceremony? Her father chimes in, offering to chip in for costs. But Jun insists they're endeavoring to make this marriage a fully self-sufficient one. Hani wonders if perhaps they shouldn't have a modest celebration, if only to bring her parents back together after growing so distant sharing the same home but leading separate lives too busy to cross paths dad brushes it off, he's just there for Rant's photo drops these days and even swats Jun's offer of a new phone. Days later, Deok Jun calls to say Song Kyung's morning sickness has become unbearable, so they're cutting the globe trotting short. Sure enough, a month later they're back in Korea. Turns out during their travels, Deok Jun Ng to deal with an overseas publisher to digitize their book catalog. He has big plans to drop on Hani in June, Hani's being promoted to a permanent role as the new design team leader, in charge of hiring her own staff. Meanwhile, June will service as deputy section chief overseeing one new sales hire. There are also plans to relocate the office in the coming weeks. Jun grabs Deok Jun by the lapels, shaking him vigorously in his excitement over Hani's promotion. Ease up, deputy! Deok Jun chides, reminding Jun that despite being a contract worker, Hani was his senior so unless he has a problem respecting his team lead's authority and higher pay grade, the man better start treating his honey as such. Jun gulps, quickly acquiescing as Hani coos that she loves the boss. May rolls around, and the moving date is set leaving the couple scrambling with precious little couple time. On the big day, Jun gripes about having his labor exploited by Deok Jun and Song Kyung as he hauls heavy boxes. Meanwhile, Hani's packing up the company manga library when a familiar BL title catches her eye. Curiosity getting the better of her, she flips to the final chapter where the male leads are honeymooning with an old woman who advises them, cherish what you have together. When the fog clears, you'll end up right where you were always meant to be. Hani snaps the book shut, turning to June with a mischievous grin, we should get married. Just then, Deok Jun strolls up with some iced coffees, but Hani's already hightailing it out, calling over her shoulder that she's got an early night. June demands to know where she's running off to, but all she'll reveal is I'll tell you later. Sure enough, later that night, Hani's covering June's eyes as she leads him to their apartment's parking lot. When she finally whips her hands away, there sits a van decked out in ribbons and bows. We're going on a wedding road trip, 
she exclaims gleefully, reminding him of her proclamation they should just elope. June's jaw drops as Hani explains she wrangled them a two-week vake, already cleared by the boss himself. Turns out she'd asked Deokjin for a few days off to go wedding dress shopping with Songkyung. Brandishing the gown, Hani announces this is her sabbatical. She unveils Jun's suit alongside a tiny dress for Rand. This makeshift caravan is their mobile wedding chapel on wheels. When Jun worries about the workload she dumped on herself solo, Hani just smiles, vowing it's worth it as she slips the veil over his bride's head and pulls him into a loving kiss. The next morning, they embark on their grand road trip nuptial adventure with Hani behind the wheel. Whenever hunger strikes, they hit up roadside markets for snacks to enjoy picnic style beside their van amid scenic vistas, snapping photos in the warm breeze until their wedding album overflows. Some days brought pouring rain, others running out of gas or gridlock traffic jams. But some nights sparkled with star-filled skies so brilliant it took their breath away. Does Hani ever want to turn back, June wonders one such evening? She shakes her head if they need to rest, that's what stopping is for. Every night they sleep together under the vast, open sky. At their final stop, a beachside haven, Hani and June splash into the surf in full wedding regalia while a napping ran waits in the van. As the sun dips below the horizon, the newlyweds settle on a blanket in the sand, June raising a glass to toast his bride. Will you, Hani, take me, Kong Sienjin, as your groom for richer or poorer, good times or bad, until your hair turns silver, he asks ceremoniously. Hani just smiles coyly, refusing to answer until he prods what gives. It depends on what you do, she shoots back playfully. Aren't promises important? If we get divorced, that's it end of story. June considers this, then rephrases, all right, how long do you want to be with me then? As he caresses her cheek, Hani's reply is tender but resolute, as long as I live. They melt into a passionate kiss until a whimper interrupts Ran woke up having wet herself. Last one to her has to hand wash the pretty dress. June calls out mischievously as they scramble over, with Hani beating him to their daughter's side. With this, this beautiful story comes to an end. Did you enjoy it? Let us know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Your support means a lot to us. Until next time, ciao.